this just i don't it's hard to say look this is a chicken on a skateboard right now here's the thing you might off why is the chicken on a skateboard what's he doing there how's he going to possibly navigate a skateboard can a chicken even work on a skateboard how would we efficiently use a chicken on a skateboard what would even the game plan be i don't know but that's not a relevant question the point is he's on the skateboard now so we're going to deal with it aren't we we're going to come up with something on the fly i've never had a chicken on a skateboard before but i've got one now that's all i'm working with so that's sort of like where i heard it's coaching like hill sign like basically <laughs> right it's another episode of the best damn league show period me and dom are back we've got right. a guest for it's this another one. episode right. of i know this one was a slight period. bit scoffed because technically we normally do an episode before the split and obviously we sort of just let the split begin and now we're doing the first episode that's because we have to have a break at some point in time so well i mean so the way I have to explain that, Tom, we've got a guy here who takes a break like every two years. He just takes half the year off. <laughs> you must be like your old mate forgiven. You just go, you know what? Actually, you're like, you know what? Spring split is over here, didn't it? Tell you what, I'll sleep back. So we've got Yamato here, who I do notice never did tell me he was going on LEC. So I also thought we were like, oh, let's get some of Yamato's exclusive thoughts. And I'll just give all my thoughts on the weekend. But then again, that's okay, Yamato, because it's the good thing. If... It was possible to have the convos and say the things on the LEC that they say on my shows. Then we wouldn't need my shows, would we? We all know these are different conversations. It's all good. One thing I will say on this episode, though, is even though you aren't the coach of Fnatic or any player right now, I do want, if you're cool with it, to do a little bit of what we did with Grabs, which is, let, yeah, we'll have the episode where we just all talk and give our thoughts about all the teams and what's going on that. But can you play, are you up for playing a bit of defense for some of your former players? So we can kind of like, if we put some of the criticisms to you, 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 you okay to play some defense and see if you can explain the player or how you see them or what their issues might be? Yeah, yeah of course, of course, bro. You can fire away. If I if, if you make me I mean, uncomfortable, also, I'll let you know. Okay, <laughs> we, we, okay. We've, we've had we've had Yamato on shows. Yeah. Yamato is the expert at saying defense or like playing defense for somebody and not actually saying anything. Oh no, he's really them. good. Yeah, he's good. <laughs> but also, yes. but also like not exactly admitting to the other side of things where they're actually you know not an issue at all. <laughs> yes, <laughs> he plays the perfect defense. No, what's great is he just has. The, I mean, everyone knows he has the voice, but he also has that gravitas behind the voice. Dom, like he'll do that thing like the fucking rock where he'll be like. It's about a vision in the team. And like already, right? You're, you're like, you're listening like, ooh, this is interesting. But then you realize like that actually doesn't mean anything about why Hill assigned <laughs> in that game. You are right. It's like, he just draws you into the story. That's the secret. Isn't he? He's really good at it. I know what you mean. I know. So it's all right, fans. You'll see, just like the rest of us, he'll start, he'll go on his whole thing. And then you'll realize five minutes in like, well, I just lose time there. I think I'll be hypnotized. <laughs> what? what was he even talking about? That was that had nothing to do with the draft. So I think we have to start here, Yamato. The first mm. topic we have to start with. Look, don't worry, there's going to be lots of great topics, lots of celebration of people. In fact, I'll even start this topic by, I'll, I'll, I'll make it more nice. I won't just start with the burn. I'll start with some of the positives and hence why the contrast is so crazy to me. I want to ask you, first of all, about humanoid. So here's what I'll say is this, uh, Yamato. I actually think these last two splits and the one coming up look like they might have almost permanently like broken the career narrative of humanoid because the vein and the narrative everyone was slotting him in before was like in terms of skill he was going to be like the next caps he was a guy who you know maybe internationally could even be like scary for the big players because he had that attitude that like don't give a fuck attitude like i'll go for the play and the i am the best i mean by the way he's not lying about that i, I can tell you he is because he's super confident but he also had the career narrative of expect here back in the day, which is like, it's okay if he starts slow in the split because he's, you know, he's the guy that doesn't care about playing SK in that B01 game. He's there for the playoffs. And once the playoffs arrive, everyone who's a fan of old school League of Legends knows this. It doesn't matter how what bad expect he looks in the split. In the playoffs, he's going to be dynamite the second he enters that server. And especially if you ever meet him in a semi or a final, he's like Muhammad Ali, mate. Don't you even dream you're going to beat him. If you do, you better wake up and fucking apologize. Like that's because he's going to turn up for those games. The <laughs> problem is humanoid hasn't really done that mate he's done that thing where it's like that was so good until last year the year you were coaching him and then that narrative it just start, it started to fade a little bit and now it looks broken because now a lot of people have noticed even in just random bo1s he's just playing bad dude like just outright bad like you know when people like mark z does that show the blame game he wouldn't even need to do an episode on humanoid dude because like he's one of the only players i've seen Hillisang's a bit like this, where just on the screen, you can see the inted. You don't have to like pause it and go, well, let's not be unfair here, guys. Like, what was the context of what he was trying to do with that or zero, putting the Fed Renekton onto his ADC? Like, there's no, there's no, there's no way to rationalize that or to like, so 
Give us, give us your take. Like I said, I, I built it up there. He had at one point in time an extremely promising career narrative. Like a lot of people thought he would be one of the all-time greats. At the moment, though, he's starting to become... I mean, it's just a serial inter to a lot of people at the moment, man. I'm worried if someone <laughs> didn't watch League of Legends before last year... They wouldn't know who Humanoid is, bro. They think he's just a bad player. In fact, they'd probably be like, how's he staying in these teams? So give us your take. Where's Humanoid at? What do you think's happened to him? Hmm. Uh, I, I think, so basically, w working with him last year, I think in terms of individual skill, in terms of his own lane understanding, it's insane. Like the, the effort he puts in and just his own, um, like playing the game through the lens of his own champion, he's been very, very good at this. I think... The main challenge with a player like Humanoid is that you need to have uh, the right players around them. In, in essence, I think the goal when you have Humanoid on your team is that you are trying to raise the ceiling of everyone's game knowledge to his ceiling. And the way you need to go about that and, and the, the way uh, that needs to happen is that Humanoid is very direct in his feedback. And if he feels like that feedback isn't accepted then he's going to slowly slowly build the resentment towards you right yeah it and, sounds like a perfect match with reckless keep on going, <laughs> Go on, keep going. and and <laughs> i think in the context of us uh, you know there's very many many different personalities that you have in in, in league for, for us last year um i think that uh, ivan razork and and hilly they are players that need to be nurtured you know sometimes you know uh, the conversations can become sometimes illogical, but uh, you have to kind of filter through it and see what they're trying to communicate with you. And you need to have yeah. patience with us, right? And this is not something that uh, is Humanoid's uh, biggest strength. I think that um, in terms of his game knowledge, in ter terms of his individual play, it is insanely high. I think that... Um, the main issue comes when the pessimism some begins to creep in. And I think that uh, that is where uh, some of the underperformances can come in. I think yeah. in the context of this year, you know, this year, uh, the, the, the same issues from the previous year carried over. Uh, they had uh, a lot of the issues that we had from the previous year were still there. And then they had additional issues that just kept snowballing. And I think to be fair to, to, to any person who uh, begins to, you know, Whenever you have a, a new start and things begin again and you're trying to kind of um, redefine yourself as a team and redefine yourself as a player in the context of that team, when there's too many things that are pointing towards the fact that everything is the same, the same patterns begin to evolve and that pessimism can really, really, you know, drown you. Uh, like, especially in the context of the current format. It's like if you go into week one and you see that everything is exactly the same, then the hope can begin to wither and become worse. I Let me ask you a direct question. Yeah. What about yeah. this, Sven? When you were describing there, like his his perspective on like, the, like for example, essentially, like a lot of people have said this to be fair in the past, like in Mad Lions and Splice, people said like he was like a, a shot calling voice as well. And he had a very good game knowledge for, especially when he was a rookie in Splice, obviously. Right. One thing I would ask is this, are you actually implying, look, there's not bad defense if it's true, that some of the moves he makes that seem inexplicable to us and definitely his team isn't on the same page and they're not following up and it looks like he just does an int or something great. Is some of that that he's just trying to play like advanced league of legends in your mind is it the case that if people don't do what he's like if people don't follow him does he like you say built resentment would he does he get passive aggressive in the game does he does he tilt do you think that's why he dies and in sometimes or throws the game is there some of that element it sounds like basically strategically he has a good mind for the game but maybe he doesn't have like the temperament to be a leader if you know what i mean i think last year i can only speak on last year in terms of how he yeah, sure. was in game um last year when it came to us playing on the weekend we were very fortunate that we had like stone cold professionals. You know, we 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 came into the weekend and whatever issues we had in scrims or problems we had in scrims didn't necessarily carry over, and we just had to kind of decipher the information that we got and kind of piece it together to a draft that actually made sense. That's why, like, we became so cookie cutter in terms of what we drafted because we wanted to replicate basically the same pattern that would allow us to, you know, just win. And um, I think always when it came to the weekend matches, even the last year, the narrative was that he that died to those early gangs and so forth. I, it, it didn't happen as much that wasn't as. A narrative. The <laughs> it, it, 
<laughs> Here's the thing, Dom, he's so it, 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 good it, 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 at what he does. He's actually explained, like, you, no, no, you know, no. Dom, when you saw him die, you didn't see him die. He was never there. Like, oh, okay. No, yeah. I'm, on, saying it, it it, I'm saying it happened, but it didn't happen as much as uh, it was... Like it, 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 it was exaggerated. Yeah, it okay. seemed like it like was something that happened every, every single game. game. And it was yeah, like ninety nine percent of his games. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, we can move on. We can move on. Whatever. Yeah, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> uh, my, my point being is, when it came to the weekend, right. he, he would actually he knew he would take he would put in a lot of effort into the game. He would uh, do his best to to shot goal. He would uh, be very very involved. But this was true for everybody. Uh, our main issue was was in practice. It's like in practice, it was like. We're trying to scrim, and then something that Humanoid had explained, something goes wrong about that. And then let's say uh, Razor or Hilly makes a mistake in scrim, which should be accepted and loud. And then it's like he regresses inwards, and, and then it's just this pattern of, you know, an environment that is created where mistakes are not allowed. And then there's resentment built, and then the, the reviews feel pointless. And then there's just this overbearing feeling of, of pessimism. It's like we could have progress, things moving in the same direction, but the moment there was a hint of anything from the past, then it's like we're starting from scratch. So it was always that pattern of, oh, we're, we're improving, we're doing better. Ah, uh, never mind. And usually, like in my mind, performance fluctuates. It's like you have to go down in order to go up higher, right? Uh, but that pattern was something that uh, I think uh, Humanoid as a player and as a person, I think he wants to feel like... Uh, oh, the feedback and the effort that I'm giving is, uh, you know, received appropriately. Because I, I talked to, to Mac yesterday, and uh, basically what he was telling me is that uh, the, the Mad Lions roster, uh, it, it functions so well with Humanoid because he could give feedback, they responded to it, and they just kind of took it. It's like, he, 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 Humanoid would just sit down with Armo, it's like, yo, do you eat thing here, you're eating here, you shouldn't fucking do this, you shouldn't fucking do this. Armo says, okay. I, I will think about it. Can you explain it again? I didn't understand. And then they just okay. moved on, you know? So they could like follow along the direction of what, what the humanoid wanted to do. And I think this is the environment that works for him. And I think with, with each player, you know, you need to figure out uh, how you function within a dynamic because okay. in the end, like Hilly as a player has a lot of strong ideas and he's been very successful sure. and that needs to be appreciated too, right? So that when there's like this conflict of ideas, I think that's where... Uh, we had most of our struggles last year. And then coming into this year, I think they heavily, you know, the roster just got downgraded, right? So they inherited some of the issues from the last split and got more issues. And I think in that, uh, I don't blame a player like Humanoid being pessimistic in that environment, right? And I don't know if he is, right? I don't want to put that on him, but I don't see how he should be as a player, especially in the context of the meta, because I think right now mid is not the most important thing, I would say, uh, in comparison to previous years. You know, he's trying to play his Azir, but his Azir is nerfed to the ground. The, the other day he tried to play LB, but LB was kind of shit in that spot because his 1-2-3 was just too terrible. And, uh, you know, he's praying to play on the Rally on Soul game just to have, like, that level of agency within a game where he can just leverage his lane knowledge. But I don't think anyone's going to let him pick that ever because he spammed, like, 60 games of it in solo queue and it kind of right. is the perfect idea of how humanoid could potentially carry a game in the context of being in a team where he don't doesn't believe in the pieces so much. Yeah. Tell you what, Dom, he did do what we asked him to do. Like that was like listening to fucking Charlie Parker play the saxophone. That was like watching Barishnikov dance. He was fucking amazing. See what he did yeah. there? He did the step over move that we got the painted Yamato <laughs> step over. He pulled it back. He fucking kicked it up a little bit. He, did, he tricked us all. It was, it was, it listen, some good angles there. I kept thinking, where's the next angle he's going? You never know the next angle he's going. There's going to be something. All I'll say is this. The joke is he's actually explained to us, Dom, all we need to do to fix the problem. We just need a time machine so that Humanoid from 2021 can come in and sit down Humanoid from 2023 and go, you're in, you're fucking up in all these ways. And if you just do this differently, <laughs> when they get there, we'll go and solve it. Problem, problem solved. Thanks, Mac. Cheers, mate. Thanks, mate. <laughs> Come on then, Don. What's your angle on this? I don't know. I just... Because where are you at? Like, gen like, pretty sure more generally, don't you find it kind of whack that, like, this guy should be... Like, you know when they do that thing on the commercial where they still make records like the face of LEC? It should... Mm -hmm. The modern-day face of LEC, by, by the way, aside from people like Caps who are still on top, should be, like, Humanoid, Larson. Like, these are the guys who were supposed to carry the league now, you know? It's kind of whack that he's, he's going to do, like, his third-rate split. That's bad. This is fucking terrible, mate. 
Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I feel like the the thing that kind of saves him here is that his teammates are actually so legitimately terrible that it it makes it so you can't really okay. criticize him so much because it's like that okay, maybe he shouldn't shuffle okay. his like the Renekton onto his AD carry, but there's no good way to play the fight when you're losing that hard. You can't actually just play like front to back. You're just losing um inc incredibly hard the entire we'll time. We'll say Tom, he does have one kill in 3 games. He's yeah. the how many, how many do Fnatic have? Is that their only kill in the all three games? Like, like what? What are the stats? I mean, it ain't great. I agree with you. The rest of the teams are they have like nine. This doesn't help. Some shit. <laughs> they got nine kills. God damn. That's, and also, I'll just throw nice. this in there to be a dick to all the people who hate on me. But all my favorite players, when they're on their bad teams, you know, everyone loves to talk shit on my boy upset. Go watch some old fucking Schalke upset videos. They're like fucking fine wine compared to humanoid on bad teams, mate. What are you talking about? You've always yeah, got a chance to win. On bad teams. What about go, that comparison? Yeah, go, look, go watch my boy Frog and on dog shit Echo Fox who can't win a series. He's still like one of the best mid laners in the lane, in the fucking league. Go watch Forgiven on all those whacked. It doesn't matter. Like, if you're a great player, by the way, that's the problem I have with this topic, actually, you might. Is I totally understand how things can collapse and the structure's wrong. And but if you're a great player, you find a way. That's part of being a great player. Yeah, yeah. No, I would just say, like, I, I think Humanoid is the type of player that can make, like, a really good team great because he's going to, like, be able to contest Caps really well okay. and, 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 and potentially defeat him uh, through his, his prowess. But I don't think he's the type of personality to make a bad team good. Right. So he's I like think the, that's, so he's that's like like the opposite the, of video. He's the, he's the inverse video. I guess. Well, that's, that's pretty much what I'm hearing. Oh, yeah, that's videos. not a bad analogy, yeah. He's, he's, the, he's the inverse video. I don't know. It, it's very hard to, to like... It, it's hard to defend a lot of the things Humanoid does without just being like, oh, well, I mean, his team is so terrible that he can't do anything that's good. I feel like that's the, the main defense that I see for him because... Like his top lane is inting harder than I think I've ever seen anyone in. I'm trying bad. to think about like a worse entrance to LEC than Oscar. No, that's probably entrance. the worst. And I think that this is probably legitimately as bad as you can possibly conceive of playing. You're getting solo killed in pretty much every lane. You're not useful in team fights. You're missing every ability in team fights. But honestly, look, maybe, maybe Humanoid is just is just doing the Lord's work from the inside out of Fnatic. He's just sabotaging the team. To punish yeah. Dardo for his sins. <laughs> and, you know, eventually, maybe if Humanoid runs it down, maybe Dardo finally gets fired and okay. they have a chance. So like, basically, <laughs> this is like the beginning what, of the Yamato, movie. Yamato, what are you? What are you? This, what? Is like, this is like the movie The Dark Knight. And basically, your Humanoid is the Joker and he's just going through that bank robbery, killing every person but one after another. And at the end, there's only him left. Right. Okay. And then he just walks out the bank. It's like, that's over. Okay. Right. That's him in yeah. Fnatic just taking it down from the inside. By the way, I will say the one factor that you do have to put in, just, look, it doesn't change how he played. He plays like shit. But I'll, I'll, just to be fair, I will shade in this factor. When people talk about the fact that Fnatic kept Razork and Humanoid. It's true, but the rumor was they were like G2, they were supposed to be in the hunt to get El Yoya. Like, I look, if they could have pulled that move off, that would be an interesting move. Like, that is like the move you try before you get rid of Humanoid. Like, reunite him with the jungler that he was awesome within the team that Yamato was talking about. Like, I think that would have been an interesting move if they could have pulled it off. Obviously, it didn't happen, though, so it's irrelevant now, you know? Yeah, no, it's 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 very fucking weird the way that they've constructed this roster. And obviously, the fact that they keep on doubling down on the worst part of the roster doesn't make know. sense. I mean, th this is the analogy that I that I gave before on the show, and I, I stick by this. Razork is like a rescue dog that had like traumatic things happen to him previously in his life, and then humanoids like an alcoholic, and they're living together in a house. I don't think that that humanoid does anything intentionally to trigger Razork, but it's just that Razork has high anxiety, and you know, you're just you're just with a drunk. Humanoid is just knocking over plates, crashing into shit. Every single fucking noise you see, just just Razor jumping up at, just twitching left and right. Like that that's really just what I'm seeing. So every like, and now okay. the problem is even worse because they are the ones that need to carry the team. They have to interact together yes. because nowhere else is good, right? Like no other part of yep. this this game is good. Here's the thing that people are missing in Fnatic games, and I even actually miss this because they didn't show it on the broadcast. But during that time where Oscar was completely into the game top, which I, I, I got to be more specific because that was like the entire weekend. So oh. during game three, when Oscar was completely into the game <laughs> in the first four minutes, um, during that that part of the game, the Zyra Khan lane, the, uh, the, the upset Kaiser lane is actually burning mm -hmm. the summoners of the Ash. They're burning lanes the, the summoners 2v2 right. of the lane that should just be shitting on them. That yeah. like When you talk to, to a support, I was talking to Treats in the call and he's like, and I asked him, how does this lane go? He's like, if the Xyrocon is good, maybe they can get through lane with like being down 10 CS and down a plate at 10 minutes, but they're going to be pushed in. They're going to be losing. They're not going to have pressure at any point. The whole reason that that game becomes so fucked up is because not only are they losing top, which 
I mean, it's not a good matchup for Orin, but dying level three is just not what, what you do in that matchup. The bot lane where they're supposed to have pressure, they're losing 2v2, so they have no summoners. So then when they start getting zoned in between turrets, uh, you know, at level five, they can't even walk up to the wave. They're, they're in threat of dying all the time because their Ash can't just walk up to them with like heal, heal flash and just start autoing them. Like he actually has to be in danger constantly of being one shot. So both side lanes are fucking losing so hard that the game just feels absolutely miserable to play from a jungle mid perspective. Like if I was in that game as a jungler, I don't even know what you do. You can't contest sides. You can't go for fucking objectives. You can't really gank without it just feeling like super stressful. Like, oh shit, I could gank this. But if I do, I'm probably just dead if anything goes wrong. I don't know. I mean, somehow they've just they've made the worst part of previous Fnatic the best part, not by improving anything that they've done, but they just downgraded all the other pieces so that now that's the only thing that's like left. So now instead of it being like, oh, you probably have the seventh or eighth best mid jungle in the league, like in terms of synergy and just the way that they play together. Now you still have the seventh and eighth best, you know, jung jungler and mid laner in the league, but the side lanes are now 10th. Like now you just have the worst top and one of the worst bottom lanes in the entire league. Okay. Yeah. You know, I've just realized, by the way, Yamato, this show is fucking brutal if you're a guest, because at least when you come out on something insight, you know, you've got that, the, the, I do all the flame and all the controversial statements, but then there's that oasis in the desert of Monty who's just professional, like, yeah, well, actually, you know, the way that they <laughs> drafted wasn't correct. But then with with this, I, I say my shit, and then Dom goes, yeah, then you know what? He's like a beaten dog. And then the other guy's like coming in <laughs> drunk, like, and you're like, fucking hell, where do I get a break? What am I, is there anything, is there a life preserver or something? Someone please. Welcome to the show. Oh, that's, that's how it goes. Honestly, Honestly, <laughs> like to, to, <laughs> to, to put it in, in a different light, I do believe Razork as a player and as a person, he would function so well with a with, with players that are very nurturing. Uh, like, yeah. I think you know, if, the if, obvious if, example, I, I, right, is if he was on G2 instead of Yike, wouldn't he be having a dream fucking split? I think he would be playing well, yeah, but yeah. I think G2 is set up in a way where almost any jungler would ah, like, fair enough. Okay. like would, would succeed there. Yeah. But I like if I see, if, like, knowing. Knowing how Jizuki is, knowing how Razork is, I think that mid jungle would be like fantastic okay. because of because of how uh, intense Jizuki is and how careful he is about making sure everything around mid lane functions and his effort to put in to make sure that the the jungler is in tune with him, right? No matter which play that is, okay. you know, like uh, I think that that's that's a partnership that would work super super well. Two two very unique players, but I think they would function super super well together. Um, I think. I think the main issue for Fnatic, it's like they, they are left with a player like Humanoid on contract. And I don't see a world where they can set up Humanoid for success on this roster in the entire year. I don't know which players they need to surround him with because he needs to be surrounded with strong players, uh, strong players, thick skinned players. And then you can elevate a player like Humanoid to uh, play towards those championship positions. Humanoid is not the type of guy that is going to, you know, uh, unless the, the, the rookie is really, really a very specific one, like, for example, Ioya, he's not going to uh, make bad players function, you know? Right. He's not going to be able to be that guy who's going to band-aid your problems. He's more of that guy that's going to elevate a good team into a, a very strong team, like he did with uh, uh, Mad Lions. And uh, Mac was telling me, it's like, when we went into the off-season, we only had Humanoid on contract, and we made sure that this is going to be functioning for humanoid and he rewarded them uh, pretty much with with two championships right he was yeah, by yeah. far the best performing mid laner and that team was much better than anybody else uh, throughout the entire year yeah i mean well, i think the 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 issue is that fanatic did it to themselves like they had the ability to retain upset and the thing that yeah. if you hear behind the scenes what happened they wanted to kick Hilly. They, they didn't want Hilly on the team anymore. So they broke up that partnership. Then Upset doesn't want to play. Then the whole team is fucking shit. Then Wonder doesn't want to play. You ruined the team yourselves. Like you made decisions to bring in people that were worse than the pieces you already had. And you you made sure that your best players weren't happy. So like, yes. I don't know. I feel no sympathy for Fnatic. And part of the reason why, like, even though Oscar's playing as bad as possible, the, the main reason I'm not going off on, on somebody like him is because I just don't believe that Fnatic management is putting him in with like a good intention. It just seems like it's it's just bullshit that they're just like, oh, whatever, just throw him in there. There's no reason why he would be ready based off what, what you've seen, right? From things that I've heard on in from people in ERLs, he wasn't a top class ERL player. He was just somebody sitting in the academy team. He's super young. Like he's, this is a team that's already not functioning. You probably need a very like, a very confident player to fill this position. You're replacing fucking wonder of all people. 
and they just they just fed him to the wolves and now he's just getting absolutely torn up i just don't believe that fanatic management is making decisions in good faith it just seems really fucking weird what they're doing i think just if if wunder is struggling you know and is having a hard time on a team like wunder is so fucking resilient and so fucking experienced it's like if he is struggling to 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 function at his best there's very few people that will like that is he's like the, you know the analogy is like the canary in the coal mine if the canary dies you know that there's toxic fumes in the coal mine was essentially that's the giveaway if wonder doesn't want to play anymore it means the team probably can't function right yes yes but it's just i i think just knowing that situation knowing some of the personalities is like they they, they lack direction in the day-to-day in within the games they, they lack that leadership that is going to move uh, the team in the specific direction and then you are moving two players from the academy uh, to fill that void when in reality it should be com- the completely other way around it's like when you bring in a rookie they should feel like most of the things are taken care of and they are allowed to just focus on their game uh, like in the context of, of yai coming into g2 it's like he has mickey han sama caps like the direction is so so clear so he has the freedom to really really focus in on himself and then expand from there rather rather than the other way around where you are just overwhelmed by all of the pressures of the team from the past and also all of the pressures of then moving into the LEC for the first time moving to Berlin for the first time moving away from a gaming house structure to an office structure you know these are a lot of things to to take in at the same time and you want to create a situation where that is simplified when you make that move rather than overcomplicated and I can't see a situation where that that situation isn't overcomplicated uh, for a player like Oscar in moving into, of course, Fnatic. Because I wanted to remind people for a second, like I did this on the last split as well, but this is one area where, because I've seen a lot of formats in esports, I'm quite good at setting my expectations based on how the format works. And so I've got to remind people, this isn't the old splits, guys. There aren't like eight more weeks for Fnatic to get it together. Essentially, if you look at the actual way the schedule works, where there's two more weeks, and next week is when they play all the lesser teams. If Fnatic fucks up next week, they're not going to make the groups a second time in a row, like another historic. Like, that's actually very, very fucking plausible right now. Not only are they 0-3, yep. and even people like XL, who they need to also potentially be bad, or the fucking Astralis of the world are actually good guys. Like, I think they're in so much trouble, this split. Like, I think for real, they're going to miss the groups again. I'm not even hating. And the reason why that seems so bad for Fnatic is even with all the problems they've had in this last split and at the beginning of this split, when you look on paper and you see the names, Humanoid Record, that should be enough to get the groups. Come on. Like, Surely there's a the band-aid out there. Yeah, you know, like, surely there's a band-aid where these guys can get a champion, they can carry a game on. You only have to do is give me like th- three wins, maybe, might even be enough. Just somehow eke out three wins and you can get there. But I actually think they're not going to do it, mate. Like, they just look... Because it's yeah. it's worse than the play. It's like what you described earlier, Yamato. There is a vibe within that team that they have, like, anti-chemistry. Like, the morale's just destroyed. So the that's, a, that, that's the biggest problem I have. Like, I, in fact, now contrast it with your team. As much as in summer last... Like, put it this way, if you watched any episodes of this show in summer last year, we flamed Fnatic almost every episode. But at the end, the last week, you got it together. You made the playoffs. In the playoffs, you gradually improved. Like, that's what happens when everything isn't totally shot across the board. I feel like this team's almost checked out already. And then, like, the Oscar in angle, he's just a new guy who's coming in and having a terrible game. Like, do you, do you have hope for them? Do you actually somehow believe they're going to make groups still? I, I feel like there's there's like states of teams that they, there's like this growth state when everything is about improving and everything is 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 healthy and you move forward and then there's the survival state which is what we were in pretty much the entire last year where we are fighting for survival and it was more about making sure that everyone feels good about playing and feel good about you know uh, the preparation and us moving on stage rather than focusing on us improving. It was more about survival, making sure everything is 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 uh, basically you just fucking you know flex tape the whole fucking ship that we're on, right? And then if you if you if you somehow during that survival phase die, that is when everything kind of falls apart. That, dead state or that is the, the state that is it? that that is like the state of hopelessness where you begin That's to fuck state. Holy shit! Pretty much, yeah. It's like you, you you're in that in in the state of mind where you don't feel hopeful about your potential and you begin to do uncharacteristic things in order to hope that something is going to change. Uh, I think 
Uh, in spring last year, when we lost to Rogue and we got reverse swept and then we got 3 0 by G2, when we were walking into that best of five, the confidence wasn't there. We uh, didn't feel like we were going to beat G2 on the day, even though we beat them uh, just a weekend before. And in that series, each individual player, uh, they looked a lot worse than they are because they were trying to overcompensate for that lack of, of that uh, idea of yeah, this is how we're going to win games. So they're going to try to overreach. They're going to try to, you know, do things that are very uncharacteristic. They're going to push for fights that are not necessary and just move away from the fundamentals because you don't believe in your fundamentals. And that is where I feel like Fnatic is now, that are they in a state of mind where they feel like they can grow? I heard rumors that their scrims went a lot better than, of course, uh, the weekend showed. Maybe there's an element of uh, Oscar Inan just being very uncomfortable on stage. But the issue with the format is that after you go 0-3 on a weekend like this, it is so tough to recover. Yep. I, 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 would, I would be very, very pleasantly surprised if Fnatic somehow, you know, for each, if they get a win or two, I would be very, very impressed. Because currently on paper, with what they delivered and what they showed, I think that they look like the worst team uh, in the region. Yeah, I mean, I have that mark, that, uh, that game bookmarked on Sunday. Fnatic versus Heretics. Oh my God. Oh, because damn. I think loser of that legitimately is going 0-9. I think well, the loser Logically that... as well, if they lose that one, there's no way they're making the group storm. If you can't beat a Rex, who are you going to win against? You're probably going to need like three win yeah. or four wins. So they, they just can't be done. I don't think it's possible. And, and Evie, Evie versus Oscar, like that is just a crazy matchup top lane. Like that is that is an insane matchup top lane that we, that we have. I mean, I also think it aged pretty poorly that, you know, Oscar did look super nervous and the video they put out was, I won't be with fear, oh, a quote it. by Oscar. It's like, yes. Jesus, man. Like, because... Normally, the thing that, that players can bank on is if you have a bad first week or you, like, make some crucial mistakes, even if you throw games, like, you're the reason your team lost, but you actually had good things going on, you can fall back on that and be like, you know what? Like, oh, it wasn't, they weren't that good. I could actually beat this guy. But with the way that these games worked, it's really hard to be mentally resilient enough to then go in and lane against the, the next people. Like, now... The person that you're leaning against immediately is Adam. And I feel like Adam, one of his strengths is that he punishes people that play scared. If you play like a pussy against Adam, he is going to fucking run you over. So that's rough. That That's super rough. And then the the last match that they play this week is against Koi. And Shigenda is another laner that I think his biggest strength is like his ability to judge waves and just punish mistakes, squeeze out CS leads and really like punish an inferior top laner that doesn't understand those those concepts on the same level. So it's it's really tough for him to, to to do anything here. I'm 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 really worried about Fnatic. And you know, at this point, I think that you should just be looking up the dates of Tomorrowland because you probably will have time to go this year. Like you you've got some Tomorrowland coming in in in, in summer, okay. and it's not that bad. Look, you get paid. You play nine fucking weeks a year. You just go party the rest of it. Like that's a pretty fucking good year for the salary. Like. Back, back in my days, nine weeks was a fucking whole split. You had to suffer for a whole split. But now you get paid for the whole year only in nine weeks. Like, that is Dude, a good fucking time. That off. even that sounds like deal. some sort of fucked up euphemism for, like, the, the like, fantasy state in their minds that fanatic management and fans have to live in. Now, we're living in Tomorrowland now. Like, we're living in the future <laughs> where we don't have these players. Like, the split will be better tomorrow. Like, you're fucking... It's so whack, it? It's so whack. Because the worst thing is, if you're a fanatic fan, I said this on somebody inside, I actually think... By by the way, that record that Fnatic had in the past years of never failing to make playoffs is almost impossible. Remember, old playoffs used to be top six. Like, the idea you never have a split, because even when they would have the dodgy ones, they would always sneak into the playoffs last second. That is incredible, by the way. Mad props to the org for that. That is almost impossible, that streak. But now it looks so bad, because not only did you fail to make, like, the next phase, but now we're on some LCS shit where, like, 80% of the league makes the next phase. You're going to fail it twice in a row. Like, you've just gone from the most historic streak ever to, like, one of the worst tweens ever. So it's just such a bad look for the org. Although I have got one angle I want to throw in here quickly because here's how I'm actually going to be controversial now. I'm actually going to say something. I said on some of the internet, it'll be quick. But here's what's controversial. I actually think the angle of like the Dardo is the one to play. It's like too reductive because here's the thing. Certainly, I disagree with like this offseason, I think was terrible. I think even the changes between last split and this split are terrible. I didn't like some of the decisions they made, like Yamato's not there. To... But even so, I right, like this... that one personally, but yeah, you can. Whatever. Well, it seems like him being on your stream. Yeah, I get it. So <laughs> here's the problem, yeah, though. The, the reason I have an issue with the idea that it's just obvious in hindsight, you notice, that the Dardo guys are moron, is, Tom, last year began with us all saying 
Fnatic has won the off season and this team should win everything. I even still, if I go back in time and I look at the players on paper, I'm like, this is a banger roster if you know what 2021 and 2022 were like. Like, that was a fucking very sick roster for the beginning of last year. Like, yeah, it didn't end up working. There were certain positions didn't work. We discussed some of it here. Like, but like, how are you going to hit on that? Like, Essentially, don't we all agree that that was a pretty good offseason if you believe the GM's a fucking idiot? Like, it, it, now we know it didn't yeah. work. And even then, by the way, when it didn't work, they came fucking second, third, and then went to Worlds. Like, no, third and third in Worlds. Like, that's if that's the worst possible scenario, I don't think you guys know how bad it can get in LEC, boys. Like, certainly this year's shit, but like... You got you got to be fair. You can only judge the move when it happened if it was a good move. We can't know at the time. No, he couldn't see in the future like we can't. Yeah, I mean, for, for sure that 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 offseason was better, but I do think that those were like pretty easy moves to come by. Like the humanoid one is is huge, but if you I have know. the money to pay to pay for him, like that's somebody who everyone wants. Like no one was like anyone who who had the money to get humanoid would want to have humanoid on their team after 2021. And then Wonder had like his stocks just all like completely plummet. And the two choices that he had were like, are we getting Alfari or Wonder? Like he had all the money in the world to make this decision. And I don't think he could really go wrong that much with, with one of those decisions. Like, okay, maybe they signed the wrong top laner, which is Alfari. Like, I still think he would have delivered enough to them for them to be similar. So a lot of those moves, it's like, uh, sure, they're, they're, they're good moves, but he's not playing the same game other people are playing. That's like Kreko making yeah. the SK fucking lineup like decent when when, sure. SK, when he came in in 2020, 2022, and he's looking with with that fucking budget with these players finding yes. like some type of cohesive unit, and then iterating on that and getting your team up. That's so much more impressive GMing than like oh we can just fucking sign the players that everyone knows are good. The best damn league show period is brought to you in association with Freeze Pipe. Want to know what's even smoother than a foreign analogy or segue? Smoking with Freeze Pipe. If you're tired of hot and harsh smoke irritating you and spoiling your experience like Dom gets sick of Evie's hard to swallow playing style messing everything up in her X games, then Freeze Pipe is the product for you. Take the food safe glycerin chamber out and pop it into the freezer for just an hour and when you take the food safe glycerin chamber out and pop it into the freezer for just an hour and when you take it out the coils inside will work to cool that smoke down by over 300 degrees that's cooler than perks winning msi styling on t1 with a mage pick in the bot lane Plus, if you take advantage of our code LFN, you'll receive a 10% discount on your order. So much like the hosts of the Best Damn League Show period, you too can get all the smoke, but have fun with it and finish with a smile on your face. Thanks to thefreezepipe.com, you can go there with the code LFN, get 10% discount. Okay. Right, let's do this then. We talked about the Fnatic one. Another interesting one, obviously, especially because they've started with like a slightly dodgy start to split, is obviously Mad Lions. So obviously now I'm going to ask about Hillasang, aren't I, Yamato? So it's okay. Here's the thing, Yamato. You're going to think it's going to be like the human one. We're just going to flame. And it's not. Here's the good news, Yamato. I've talked to so many of Hillasang's teammates over the years, privately as well as publicly. I think I get it, mate. And I've even come with a prop to help explain to these fans what it's okay. like to work with Hillasang, right? I'm do you see this here, right? Look. This just, I know it's, it's hard to say. Like, look, this is a chicken on a skateboard, right? Now, here's the thing, Yamato. Why is the chicken on a skateboard? What's he doing there? How's he going to possibly navigate a skateboard? Can the chicken even work on a skateboard? How would we efficiently use a chicken on a skateboard? What would even the game plan be? I don't know, but that's not a relevant question. The point is, he's on the skateboard now, so we're going to deal with it, aren't we? We're going to come up with something on the fly. <laughs> I've never had a chicken on a skateboard before, but I've got one now. That's all I'm working with. So that's sort of like where I heard it's coaching like Hill Sack, like basically. <laughs> oh you don't get this on the LEC, <laughs> you don't get this fraud. <laughs> okay, all right. Come on, come on, hit me with it. Come on. Yeah, man. I think that this two layers, <laughs> this this chicken on skateboard can do some crazy tricks. Exactly. He can do, yes. he can do kick flips, seven sixties. You, you know, <laughs> as, he's as wild, man. As, he's wild. Yeah. As long as his teammates believe in him, he can do some crazy tricks. Yeah, uh, Elise. Uh, Hilly is fantastic. I think Hilly, I think in terms of figuring out lane phase, I think he's so fucking good. Like he, he pays attention to the the finest details of, of the lane phase. Sometimes 
sometimes he applies the same thing into the mid game and the macro game and sometimes that is a bit too much where you like look too many like we, we just, let's focus on what we can replicate between the game but no this is important if we flashed here we could kill all of them that was like always the thing with with him right. because they were so similar i think Hilly's weakness was in the past like when i worked with him was um he um always had teammates around him that uh knew how to enable Hilly and get the most out of him. I think like Hilly and Book were such a strong pairing. Uh, Hilly and Ops is such a strong pairing because they are so involved with each other and they made sure that uh, Hilly's opinion is heard and his thoughts are elaborated on and they are patient with with him and his thought process. Because What about Hilly Niski? I always thought that that it seems to, to have worked the, the, yeah. the two times that they've played together. Thoughts? I think Hilly Niski, I think... Uh, to to some degree, yes, but I think at the same time there is a certain level of uh, it's it's not as close quarters as, for example, jungle support or or um, uh, mid. Uh, I mean, uh, AD and support. Right? I think it matters, but I think the the other versions of it is a little bit more important. But if I try to think back, like when we worked with Niski, I think. The most dominant force in the team was just Whippo, Hilly, and Upset. And I think that was that made up the majority of all of the needs that were met. So I think in that context, that relationship didn't need to be as strong as it potentially could be in the context of current Mad Lions. Yeah. Because the majority, it's like usually the team's identity is defined by the majority. And uh, our majority there in terms of what the values are and how we view the game was just uh, Hilly, Whippo, and then Upset. And then we had Adam and Niski as our, you know, sort of supportive players in the idea and the identity that we had as a team. So uh, maybe in the context of current Mad Lions, maybe that uh, relationship what about is stronger. In terms of personality balance? Because I feel like if, you, if you're saying that Hilly's a player that needs that, like, support and, like, you know, he needs to feel like his teammates think he's good. I always thought that Niski was the type of player that that people just got along with like he didn't really have problems he's not going to criticize you in, in a super negative way and then also in terms of just the way that they see the game it seems like niski is also in that like mentality of they're inting they're inting they're inting kill them they're inting that type of uh vein so what do you think about that specifically um i'm trying to think back now i i think niski is is a very positive force to have within a team in terms of making it um like basically lowering the overall stress of the day-to-day, -day, which I think is super important. I think that he uh, provides a lot of relief in terms of some of the comments he does. He's... You're making it sound like he runs a fucking bathhouse or something. <laughs> oh, fuck. Keep going. Keep going. No, no, no. He's lowering the stress. He's providing a lot of relief. You know, he's out to massage out those difficult knots in the... No, he's, he's, good, just, he's just very good at having And in the end, it's just fun, a happy ending you know? and we all go to world. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so he's, yeah. he's very good at having fun. You know, you, you, you have sure. those characters, you know, that definitely, you know, uh, lower the amount of stress that you have within the game. It's like... Niski is one of those guys. We've seen Broken Blade to be this type of person. Flakid has also comes across to me as this type of person. It's like Jezuke as well. I remember in Vitality, this guy just fucking starts laughing because the enemy mid laner misses a spell. And when you hear that within the, within the game or in the context of your day to day, it definitely, you know, amount of stress and the pressure that can amount, that is definitely like a, a, a thing that matters. I think Niski is very, very good at uh, being just that. I think that he is very socially aware of, of his teammates, which I think is an attribute that should be, uh, you know, valued, you know, because it's oh. not not something that is tangible, but it's something that is visible when you work with someone on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's hard for me to answer this question specifically in the context of Hilly and Niski, because in the context of our team, just that relationship didn't need to be as strong as it potentially could be in the current roster. I know just that um, I, I, I spoke to Mac yesterday in regards to the team, and he was telling me that Hilly was um, taking a more forward approach in terms of how he connects with his teammates. And I think that's a, a massive sign of growth uh, from Hilly because in the end, uh, Hilly is very experienced. He has, uh, he has won championships and he has been a part of many rosters that have been very dominant and he has figured out uh, how to be a part of teams that, uh, you know, compete uh, within Europe. And I think that um, him recognizing that uh, he can be that dominant and positive force and be the first kind of domino brick that uh, that starts the reaction. I think this is the main thing that that Hilly uh, needs to 
work on. And Mac basically confirmed that this is something that he's doing, that he's connecting with Chasey. Chasey is the new guy that comes okay. into the team and he's being very nurturing. He's helping Kazi a lot in terms of the lame face bottom side and he's taking more of a, a leadership role. And I think that um, in regards to the other personalities that are on the team, I feel like that um, my, my general impression is that he gets the space uh, to do just that. I think Hilly as a, as a person, if he feels like people trust his words and he feels like, honestly, this is true for anyone, right? If, if, if a person feels valued, uh, whatever that means for each individual, uh, they're going to perform better. And I think uh, Hilly, when he feels important, feels valued, and he can take um, his motivation from how much he cares about his teammates, this is the best version that you can get uh, uh, of Hilly. I can remember this this story, right? Like I can tell you this story. When we were facing up against G2 and uh, he played like the craziest best of five, like he made Reckless and Mickey look like amateurs in this best of five where he's picking Pike and he's just- This was the three zero one, one, right? Uh, we we like went that, three right? and two, it was oh, very like contested. Like okay. but, but Hilly's performance, like he was in some kind of fucking Zen state. Like he's, I've never seen someone channel Pike Q and before it's thrown two people flash. Right. Like I, <laughs> that, that's how deep he was okay. in their brains, right? Yeah, and, deep in something else too. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> and in, in that context, right? I remember Hilly was like, upset, you're going to go to Worlds. And he just entered this kind of flow state. And the moment he said that, I was like, the, the, this is true. There's, and there's no way you don't believe this shit. And um, I think we can, when he can draw that, um, that strength and that motivation from his teammates that he truly <laughs> feels connected to them, he turns into a different player. So it's very important when you have a player like Hilly on your roster to really, really, you know, be patient and, and, and nurture and make sure that uh, he gets that opportunity to, to speak in front of his teammates and to uh, share his words. Because even on Unicorns of Love, like the moment Hilly left Unicorns of Love, Unicorns of Love just, they just, they just disappeared from the league. Before that, they were really, really fucking competitive. And, uh, you know, they, uh, I think Hilly was a very, very big part of that. Like they played two finals somehow with rosters that, with players that oh, you sure. you barely even know anymore. Yes. It's like, sure, Vichy Chachi, but then there was like a lot of players that just came and went. And uh, the one, yeah, Exile, like uh, who else? I guess. Uh, I guess Power Evil went to, to Misfits after and then to, to North America. Kikis is one that uh, we picked up later, but uh, there was a lot of players that came and went. I remember there was Diamond yeah, Prox yeah. at one point, there was Gilius, there was Svenskir, and there was... You know, a lot of players that came and went, but the, the common denominator was always was always hilly. Bro, he, since he keeps name dropping that he's talked to Mac Dom, can you even imagine how those convos must go? Like, imagine fucking Yamato, Mac, and Peter Dunn trying to go and have a fucking coffee in Berlin somewhere. And at the end, you know, the check comes. And then obviously Mac's like, well, as a group, I think we've got to make positive forward progress to who's going to pick up this check. And then Yamato here is just like, I think someone here is making uncharacteristic mistakes in uh, calculating the bill at the end. And then Peter's like, ah, guys, I think you'll find um, if we could just split the bill, like we agree, because last time I paid, if you don't, like, fuck it. And then we get to the point, what did Shorby euphemism central 24, sir? And they each just take 10 minutes to answer, like, <laughs> There was a voice of Yamaro episode that's coming out today. Okay. So it's like, there's, there's a conversation that people can right. listen to. There you I'll go, just do there you go. plug. You know, usually I don't plug. forget anything when, I, when I'm here. It's all showed, good. But now I'm, now I'm a content creator, so I have to, you know, need to be a bit of a leech. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Perfect. It's all good. Right. What about this then, Dom? What are your actual thoughts on Mad Lions this, thus far? Because obviously it has been a slightly dodgy start. Like, I thought that yeah. BDS game was a bit fucking so like I expect him to win that game easily, mate. I don't but know. They it was look, a bit dodgy. They look weird. I mean, also like when if Chasey doesn't play well, the team he's a coin flip worse. and half, isn't he, mate? If he if he flips the wrong side, he's bad. <laughs> he's gonna be good yeah. though. He can definitely carry some games. Yeah, I mean, it just looked like he had never played the Fiora Darius matchup before in his life, or his perception was he's like, oh yeah, Fiora just shits on Darius, and then he played against Adams Darius. He's like, wait, I can't just like save my parry for the pull. Because I just died of fucking auto attacks. In way, how are people anyway. still doing that, by the way, Tom? Like, how are people getting surprised by, like, an Adam Ola for Darius in 2023? I mean, like, bro, like, I think the, like, the, the fucking, the, the scouting reports out on this guy. What are we doing? Like, how are you getting surprised reports, by that? I don't Look, I don't know who the fucking <laughs> analysts are in LEC, but they are dog shit. It's wild, job. isn't it? I know. 
like the Draven to Han Sama, like him getting two Draven games. Like yes. how is Hans getting Draven every game? Like you're watching. Like, like Evie got fucking Cassante for eight games in the beginning. What happened when they start when they stopped giving him Cassante? What happened when he stopped playing Cassante? What is Evie's win rate off Cassante? I don't even remember what question you asked me. Something about Mad Lions, but I'm gonna flame Evie right now. What is the what is the win rate off Cassante? Okay, look, yeah, I'm gonna guess this. like two wins or something. What is it? Come on. No, it's one win. One. He, okay. he had nine games on Cassante with a 44% <laughs> win rate, and then since that he has three games on Jax. He won one of them, and then he lost. He lost the other two. Then he lost two Renekton, one Gwen, one Trindamir, one Gragas. He loses every game. He doesn't get Cassante. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? Like, I don't understand what the fuck is going on in this league. So. Sure. I mean, I guess no, people... I just like the way the question was about Mad Lions and Dom goes. And here's another reason every fucking sucks on heretics. Like, <laughs> let me find out mathematically why he sucks. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, mathematically, he is just inefficient <laughs> off Cassante. But yeah, I mean, it's the same. It's, a, it's the same thing. Go back to your point. How do we get there? It's just Chasey playing the Fiora versus Darius yes. matchup. Dude, this guy is just willing to play Darius into matchups that you don't think are good Darius matchups. Yes. So instead of trying to counterpick the Darius and then in real time figure out that the matchup is not as bad for Darius as you thought it was, why don't we just ban the champions that Adam's good at? You saw what the fucking Scion was. He was yep. trying to lose that game. Like, he was attempting to lose the Scion game. I would investigate it if it was anyone other than Adam. So it's it's really it's really rough to see some of the, the decisions that are made. But Mad Lions just look like out of practice or something. I wonder if because they went to finals, they took like time off, like just they took like a week off or something and maybe they're just getting back into form. I'm not really sure. I'd would, I would be surprised if they've been um, playing as many scrims as, as some of the other teams that were knocked out earlier. By the way, you know when people do that thing where they go, oh, remember when uh, Kazi used to not be able to play Aphelios, but he's really putting the time. This game was fucking terrible. What are you talking about? Like, do we had the wrong gun yeah. half the time? What the fuck? Like, that, listen, Kazi was actually pretty legit last split. Fair play. The bot lane improved a lot. But, mate, this game was a bad game. Like, get off that fucking champion. You just do not know what that champion does. Come on, bro. This was gross. That bot lane looked bad this game, Dom. Yeah. No, they, no. they, looked, they looked really rough. I mean... The the other fucking game that they played, I mean, into up, upset. I mean, they just got completely rolled the entire time. Like there was some oh. points where they were doing okay in the lane, but I mean, overall, they just played the majority of the lane bad. They just they really just looked out of practice. I would be surprised if they had scrimmed as much as other teams. I, I can add that um, I'm I'm assuming. Well, I, I I can pretty much I think confirm that all of the playoffs teams took took a week break pretty much after after the the finals weekend. Right. Is that considering Mad Lions played three back to back best of fives on a completely different patch? I think that there is a, a real case to be made about uh, split fatigue. Uh, I think in terms of. I, I think there's a lot of things that changed in, in, in the meta in terms of the patterns that we see. And I felt like at least in the final game that they played against Koi, that looked a lot more uh, like a Mad Lions game. Uh, like Elioia was very active. They played the Annie support with the Lee Sin Jungle. That seemed to be more in line with what I expect from Mad Lions. And I think like my main concern was that after the G2 series that looked very very rough on them and I think that was like a very very tough beat because it didn't seem like even when they had winning positions they couldn't really have they didn't really have the focus to play them out uh, appropriately uh, which just seems to me like it was a very challenging one on every aspect gameplay wise and also on on the mental side uh, I was concerned that that uh, cause like tremor effects into the next split and they kind of uh, had lost their confidence because that's how it looked like game one and two. But at the same time, you know, I think the game one and two games had maybe weaker preparation. You had the affiliate stretch to try to figure out and everything kind of looked out of line and then it kind of, the decisions they made within the game kind of reeked of desperation. But at least I think the Koi game looked like a very classic Mad Lions game. So I I think that is very redeeming for uh, for what they are even though Koi isn't the strongest team right now. Yeah. What about this then? Let's talk a little bit about SK Gaming, because the way I would set this team up is, this was the team where, like, I, I was so concerned for this particular split, because when people have the run like they had, where it's like, at one point they were looking in the last split, like, maybe they're actually like the second best team. Dude, is this possible? Can they be in the final against G2? Now, obviously, they had the story that every underdog has, like, oh, we were that close, we almost beat Mad Lions, and then we would have beaten Coin, then we would have been in the final. But the problem is, you didn't do that. So I can't give you the credit for doing that. And even worse, then you worry, like... 
Maybe your chance went. Maybe this split starts and you're not as good or the other teams are good or people are figuring out your style. They look great. They just look great yes, again. Sir. Like, actually, yeah. I was so worried they'd they have a slow start. They look awesome, mate. If anything, actually, they look like one of the teams that have consolidated what they did last split. They just look even better now. Like, as much as we'll talk in a minute about, you know, Vitality could obviously be a top team. This team looks like they should be a contender. Like, it's legit, right, Yamato? No, in my mind, there was two things that were concerning for me about, uh, about SK. It was... Uh, their, uh, basically how they play around mid, I think this was very concerning to me. And also what happens in a circumstance where they don't need to contest through bottom side and they need to connect with support through mid. Right. And then finally it would be like how they actually contest objectives and how they set up fights. Because in a lot of their losses, they were like overreaching in their fights. I remember the series against Koi, they were overreaching first week that they played in, in the league as well. They were just like running it down, fighting every moment they could. And I think these three games we saw a lot of action around mid i think certus had a fantastic week everyone was hyping certus last split but i think this this weekend was a very positive one the talia game i think the akali game was good too i think the annie game the annie performance of course i think against astralis being able to play around the 3v3 mid i think there was a different look for dos and i think just the game against bds very very good fundamentals in terms of how they set up objectives and punish where bds are at their weakest and that is when like the process of setting up objectives can't start around the timing where drake spawns it needs to start like basically at the point where drake dies so you can set up waves in a way where it becomes the most economically viable for you to do drake in terms of how you set up your waves and then you need to be first on objective so the enemy needs to make a kind of choice but bds were very slow and then they were turning really really well on the pixel bush they were just fighting and finding really yep. really good turns on the enemy and i think this just shows to me that sk BDS, continues to improve BDS does do bds does give you that angle a yes lot, yes though. for sure like they do this is like their biggest weakness yeah, I would say uh, exactly. That's that's what I, that's the one caveat I would put there is that even though they did execute that well, I have to see it against better teams because overall they played against. I mean, obviously, Astralis won their first two games, so they that looked like it was going to be a closer game than it ended up being. But they did play against BDS Fnatic, who looks like just the worst team in the league, and Astralis. So they haven't played against any of the the top tier teams, and. Yeah, they still kind of just got mega behind versus BDS, which has been their problem, right? They're, they're, they're yes, a yes. 10k gold deficit comfort zone. And right now, with how Vitality and G2 are playing, Vitality and G2 are just playing to try to shit down your throat. Like, I know G2 had, like, that bad game versus Astralis. I don't put too much weight on that. I still think G2 is probably the best oh. team in the league. They're the team to beat. So I think that SK is still going to have the issue of just getting mega out lane versus the top teams, and they just won't be able to breathe in those games because... Being down three to four K going into Drake fights, like it, it's very hard to actually play them well enough to be able to win them considering that deficit. By the way, as a direct comparison, if they play those teams, I'm with you. I think those teams should beat them. But I will I agree, say yeah. this, just because I think it's a fair point to sell on behalf of SK Gaming. The same lineup you're talking about them playing this week, Dom, I agree, not the hardest schedule. So they played Astralis, Astralis beat G2. They played BDS, BDS beat Mad Lions. These are the top two teams yeah. in the league. So I will just say, that's a very good positive sign too, if you're SK, that you, at least you take care of business against the teams below. You know, like, that, like you, even some of the top teams don't do that. Yeah. So I, that's also positive to me. Because I think in the LEC now, I mean, you've seen it with the format like dude there's a lot of teams can beat a lot of the teams in this bo one stage you just see it so different yeah. i think sk is kind of like the inverse bds where like bds has good lanes where sk i feel like they generally get behind early game but bds has like multiple catastrophes for, for yes for every single game like we just have it in our chat we always just say like oh where's when's the bds catastrophe coming because you know one time right. per game they're going to completely run it down they're all going to die that's no way to talk about grabs if he joins your call stream he's oh sorry you meant oh shit you meant in the game my apologies no I'm he sorry, avoided grabs. the catastrophe he didn't join fanatic they tried to, to, to loop <laughs> oh, him in that's true. Like, hey, they did. yes grabs you want to join you want to exactly. join this and he said fuck no fuck you i'm staying where i am so uh, by the way, that also would have been the biggest trap of all time if Grabs joined Fnatic. Like, literally, the guy, even when he was winning MSI, being flamed for bad drafts, is going to join this lineup of players. Like, bro, you dodged the bullet on that one. That was just like, that was like some old fucking 1950s Hollywood movie where you're the private investigator who hasn't had a case in a while and some beautiful blonde walks in your mouth and takes off her sunglasses and flips her hair like, and goes, oh, you won't believe my husband. He's a, he's a drunk and an alcoholic. If only someone would kill him. It's, like, it's the most obvious setup of all time. If you go there, you <laughs> gonna get fucking wrecked like so grabs actually did dodge the ball that one man that was just it was too obvious it was too fucking you know the yeah. cheese was just right on the mousetrap wasn't it like you know 
No, I respect him for being able to turn that down. A lot of people would be like, this is where I like, prove, exactly. you know, people are flaming yes. me with what happened with, for what happened with BDS. Now I join Fnatic. Exactly. I bring them, bring them out of this. You know, I have good players. Look at the lineup. It can't be that bad. That would have yeah. fucked him over completely. But yeah, I, I, my, my point was that SK is the inverse of BDS where they, they never have the catastrophe. It feels like they, yes. they always play like they always make teams sweat for their advantages and to beat them throughout the game, which is really good versus most teams because a lot of teams will make one bad decision during a game. And if you can exploit that, you can get in a winning position. And I feel like SK almost never loses games when they have a winning position mid to late. Oh, yeah. by the way, one thing I wanted to chuck in as well, the difference between this split and last split is last split, Irrelevant did just get to do what he did in Misfits. He was just a weak side top player who was probably going to play like a bruiser or a tank. And we heard all these stories of like, oh, the reason that everyone has to ban Jax is just Jax just ferocious and scrims. Dude, you're seeing it this split now. He can actually carry as well. Like, you've seen him on that Renekton. He's fucking legit, dude. Like, this guy, if he actually has a real Jax in his pocket and a Renekton, and he's one of the best weak side top players. Like, what a fucking mad, like, pickup this is because it's been such a great one. Like, just be amazing since he joined this team. What do you think, Yamato? I, I am a big fan of Ir Irrelevant. I think it starts in Champion Select. I think the, the way SK have found advantages and when they actually beat, like they beat G2 in the regular season, they were first on playing the Elise and they played the Elise, Siviyumi, and then 4-5, they recognized right away. This is a front-to-back situation. Can you slam the Sion? And this was before Sion became like, yep. yo, just lock it in, lock it yes. in. And I feel like Irrelevant... Irrelevant has always picked the champion that completes the composition ah, and sometimes nice. puts himself in worse matchups and is always going even. He's always going even and he always finds a way to complete the composition. And I think this has been a massive strength for SK, the fact that they are allowed to do this without him, you know, getting destroyed or something. I feel like always he's effective in the game. And I think SK is very good at recognizing how the game is going to play out based off of what they've picked one, two, three, and then supplement that accordingly with uh, their solo lane uh, champions. And I think most of that falls on Irrelevant. I think that he's been insanely consistent and I think that's so, so important in a world where, you know, usually uh, you've had a situation where bot lane is, is everything is so bot lane centric. Uh, there was a lot of uh, fights around bot side, the Lucianami, the Yumi. And I feel like when you have a top laner that it is not picking something to just pad the stats, you know, playing like a gore drinker, Renekton blind and goes even is completely useless in the game. He's picking the champion that is going to be, you know, you know, most relevant in the game. I didn't want to make this pun. I feel kind of ashamed of myself. It was unintentional. Oh, uh, but uh, he um, is just overall very, very effective. And I think this is what you want from from a top laner, just that level yep. of consistency. He team fights really well, too. He's yeah, like one yeah. of the best team fighting uh, top laners. And then like the way he plays side lane is, is also extremely well, uh, extremely good. The way he plays side lane is not necessarily to pressure side and win it super hard, but he avoids ever dying. Like he's very rarely dying on side lanes burning enemy resources and then his tp usage is extremely good too which is so rare when you oh, consider this sure. is his rookie year man like yep. he he played one split last year this is still his first yep. year in competitive and he just looks like a mega veteran he looks like yes. he's super super stable in all points and like his mentality towards the game with yamato saying about draft like yeah he has no ego in draft and he plays things that that are thankless gives his team draft resources and then he executes them well which is harder for a lot of players to do than to you know, maybe do the Adam thing where you're getting resources and you are like playing like your champions that you're super comfortable on all the time. Yes. In fact, I'd even say another thing I'm very impressed with, because as you said, Dom, he's only essentially coming into his third split now. And obviously the last one was like a mini split anyway. Like this guy actually also has an amazing flaw to his game. When does he ever play bad? You know what I mean? Like, Yes, just he's either like average or just good. It's like it's actually outrageous yeah. how efficient he is. And I'll throw this in there. When you look at how SK is doing, like I said at the beginning about the fact they are actually a contender, dude, it makes sense. If you look at the lineup, three of their players are in the contention for best at their role, fucking top jungle and ADC. Like they actually have, like you said, put together a banger roster. Like what a great fucking whoever had the eyes on this roster did a great job. Yeah. And like I said before, by the way, there was a world where the, if they'd have zigged when they zagged in the off season, the only difference is they'd have had Yankos. Bro, that, that might even be better. Who the hell knows? Like, that SK killed it this offseason. Whoever, whoever worked on that one, a plus. Especially whoever as... Did, he, Krepo, whoever did. He, yeah, fair play. Crepple there. I don't, here's the thing. I don't, yeah, know if he wants to be, I don't know still if he wants to be public, publicly known for that if we're supposed to keep it secret. I don't yeah, know no, I, no, I think he's fine with it. He came oh, on okay. a couple, like, co-streams and stuff, so he, people enough. know he's the GM. 
Right, let's do this then. Let's let's have a fun convo. Let's talk about the Vitality one. So I saw, this is how weird the internet's gotten now, Dom, because I've always said this, even though like a lot of people who do shows together, for example, like I don't, I don't have, to, there's not time in my life to watch like the show that Monty's on with Dom, for example. So essentially I have to have the convo with him when I'm here now. But because of the way algorithms work, I did see bizarrely, because I just opened my YouTube and, and your clips channel had a clip of you watching my video about Vitality, because obviously now fucking yep. LSK drill and Dom have all figured out it's like React video inception where you just, <laughs> You don't, you don't, don't almost, make your own comment. Just comment on my comment. And no, okay. I almost I watched a video today of Kadrel <laughs> watching an LS video. That's okay, what I did. Right. I, You've got that deep. To a video okay. of reacting to an LS okay. video of LS reacting to a draft, and I just made sure that like I had the the the, the stance like no matter what it is, I just say the opposite of what the other two people said. <laughs> it's the better. That's the better. Okay. Just take like the position where okay. you know LS starts with like yes. this this fanatic draft is terrible. Then Kadro comes in. Actually, I think that the fanatic draft is okay. And then I said this fanatic draft is the best draft known to man. There I love go. this fucking okay. draft. So yes, that's, are you that's posting this because I need to react to to yours? Exactly. Yes. Yeah, I only actually reacted to a minute. I, I kind of sold it, you know, because it was funnier if I made it seem <laughs> yes. like I reacted to the whole thirty minute video. But yeah, you know, it, it was only about a minute. You, you got to react to Kadro. So the point is, I actually do know, bizarrely, that Dom has seen my video I did about a Vitality you had an upset. So if people don't know, I try because I, I like to do this, but I just think it's legit if you really think so. Obviously, I hadn't seen the roster play at the time. Like, I posted it during the weekend when they played the first games. So I'm doing a pure speculation. Like, obviously, a roster that hasn't ever played, it could be way worse than you think. I'll just say it straight up, and I think the games make me look good, mate. I think this team is going to win the split. I'm not even saying they're going to be like, they can contend with G2. Can be, I think this team will win the split. And essentially the quick version is, first of all, Kaiser immediately looks like half fixed just from immediately playing with upset. Like they're clearly on the same page. And then now that they've got upset, and by the way, this is how anyone who thinks last year we were overrating upset. Bro, he hasn't even played this year. He just walked in. He's the best again. He's the best <laughs> already. He hasn't even fucking died. And by the way, Ender, you utter clown. What was that question like? Do you think he can go undefeated for the rest of the group? Why would he go undefeated? Why would he not die for six games as ADC? Like, bro, come on. That, that's uh, Look, I know you just asked it off the top of your head, but like, keep it on the top of your head, mate. That's a shit question. I'm, a, I'm an interviewer. I can tell you that was a bad question. So anyway, and it's just fucking nonsense, isn't it? Like, what's he going to go? Like, no, I think he probably should die seven times next game. Shut the fuck up, you idiot. So anyway, to bring it back, though, he looks amazing. And then when you look at the team now, spoiler, <laughs> Photon still hasn't had a bad game ever at LEC, as far as I can tell. Perks just was literally just being chilling. Didn't even have to do anything in some of these games. Guys, this team, for real, I think can be one of the best Western lineups we've ever had. Like, it looks like, for real, you can play through all three lanes. You have a jungler who can carry jungle and supportive jungle. And if they've actually fixed Kaiser... This is over, boys. I think this. I think this lineup. The potential is crazy, in my opinion. I know, obviously, I'm hyping them. They only played three games, but I think this could be like, like pretty sweet. This is the team I really want to see at MSI if they could play like this. Hundred percent. I think it's I think, really good yeah, for right. for Europe as a whole if Vitality just plays at MSI. This should be the team that you want because the other teams are not going to cut it when they're playing versus Asian teams. Like the other teams just don't have the baseline skill level, player for player, to be able to compete with 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 the Asian teams. Um, right now, I think there's a couple things that I need to see from Vitality before I'm like going to crown them. Like I need to see Kaiser not playing things like Rakan because like Rakan has always been Kaiser's best champion to me when he was originally smurfing with Mad Lions in 2020 when he joined the league, he was just the Rakan guy. So I've always thought he was just better on, on that type of pick. And there are, there is going to be times where you just won't be able to draft and engage support. How does he look in those times? I need to see that. Oh, let's and then see also, if he plays a Lulu or a Nami or something, right? Yeah. And here's okay, so that's the real take. Now, now we get into the fake take because you Go know on. I always have to have like some right, bullshit, on. sarcastic <laughs> fake take, and then okay. people will just criticize me for it later. Here's the fake take. The thing about upset that I don't like is that he always wants to carry from a carry role. Like he has people come bot, they keep on giving him resources. Like why does he want resources yeah. on the AD carry instead of just like letting them carry from top lane, which is supposed to be the fucking useless role on the on on the map? So exactly. what what do you th what do you think about that? Like he keeps on having people come bot. Like look at Reckless, he never has people come bot. They just lose slowly. Perfect. I think this this whole conversation about resources is so fucking mental because it's like if you <laughs> play well, if you play lane well. There are resources there for the taking. It's not like your jungler and oh, this jungler is the carry on that team. He's he's coming into your lane. You're just fucking jacking your wave, taking pen, smiting it. Then goes takes more camps, and then he has more CS. It's like no one thinks about distribution of gold that way. It's usually it's oh, we have Drake three coming up. Oh, I need gold for this item. Oh, take my Raptors. That's fine. But no one's thinking oh, this guy's the carry. Take everything. Take everything. I'm I'm the resource muncher. It's 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 completely mental how how this has this perception has built. Because like especially for us last year, it's like we're playing for bot because 
That was our best odds in terms of winning the game. So that's yeah. what we're going to do. We're not going to fucking... Teams are doing that. It's not fucking like, kindergarten where we're going to fucking, fucking make everyone feel good about themselves. Yeah. No, it's like... It's the same conversation with Uzi, right? It's like, yo, we tried to play through topside. I remember Uzi fucking played Quinn and was roaming the map, you know, trying to figure it out. But then they realized, yo, why the fuck are we doing this shit? When we pass the boat, we're fucking winning the game. So why should yeah. we stop? You know? It's like <laughs> that same conversation always. And just my take on Vitality, I, I think... In terms of mechanical skill, like raw, I think that they can they can be they are like fucking at the top. Fucking the potential there is insane. I think if they are playing games with their winning lanes, and that's gonna happen often, they will dominate and choke you out and make you look like shit. The main question for me is when the games are more contentious, are they going to experience that same level of um uh I guess questionability you know sometimes we hear these comms come out and people just shouting and they make decisions that are kind of you know off the cuff like they're diving tourists they shouldn't be diving and they're kind of you know all over the place i think that is like the main question because i think if i imagine them in the best of five against g2 i think g2 is very sharp in those moments if they see that you are disconnected in some type of way they really really fuck you hard and this is something that g2 g2 is really really good at if they can find leads i think they'll be able to convert super well and they'll find leads leads against most players in the entire league but the main test will be if the games are more contentious and the drafts are more contentious what is going to happen later on in the game i think upset is a very positive and dominant force and like a, a very good communicator in terms of direction within the game and i think either way that is a massive massive upgrade for vitality but i think before i am ready to crown them the winner I would have to see them play out those more contentious games. Because in the end, Vitality last split two in the regular season, they were winning games, but it was very clear that the bot lane looked like shit. Now they're winning games and their bot lane is looking good. That is like the 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 evolution I feel so far. By the way, to talk a little bit more specifically about upset, because I will say this, you you actually made me look so good last year, Yamato, because when on my show I do with Rich, uh, Rich's Wrath side select, that one I do with Foxtrop, where it's sort of like more like a like a variety show, we talk about League and CSGO, one of the topics was we did like the All Pro, right, which you do in the past, after the regular split, obviously, in the last years, right? And then off for the All Pro, if you remember, this was when Fnatic, like I said, just snuck in on the last week to playoffs, right? So everyone else was put in as ADC, like... Well, the joke is they weren't putting Unforgiven. It was voted all pro in the actual thing. But they were putting the other more reasonable ones that people would put there, right? And I picked Upset, right? Which I even said when I did this. It's going to upset people, like, no pun again. Because obviously people are going to think Fnatic's bad and he's had some dodgy games and he couldn't carry him. But the reason I picked him was because I said at that time, I actually thought ADC was just like, it wasn't like a very solidified conversation. There was a lot of, like, up and down teams. And there was teams like Misfits obviously winning games that had, like just like, you know, an ADC that only wins in the team fight and the lane's not strong. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to pick him because I think he's just the best ADC. And then right after that, you had all those playoff series where it's like, it just look fucking amazing. Like anyone who wants to talk shit on upset, I don't, I actually think this, right? If you did it before summer split last year, you're just a plebo has no eye test, but that's okay. There's a lot of casual fans. I get it. So fine. If after summer last year, the playoffs, you're still talking shit on upset, you actually just fundamentally irrationally hate this guy and don't know anything about League of Legends. Because it's like Dom's joke there about resources. What's he supposed to do? Not take a this mid wave and let like his scion come down. It's like, what are you talking about that wouldn't make any sense like in that scenario go and watch those playoff games if even if it was true right I, I, it isn't but let's imagine it was true all the claims about upset Yamato like he, he just demands it all he's selfish well you know what? he was fucking right in that scene there wasn't he because it looked fucking amazing when they gave up Herald and he just took all those waves and carried every motherfucking game and on top of that then he, because they had that bot lane, which was the only like legitimate part that they knew could carry, then Yamato could at least band aid the bloody draft. Like, it feels like upset was like the play you basically like dug yourself out of the hole with last year, right? Uh, no, for sure. It's like we, we had a very clear identity in terms of what is successful. It's like we, we tried, we definitely tried to create circumstances where we played through top side or played through mid. And I don't want to put that blame solely on one person, because in the end, if you commit to an idea within the game, everyone needs to commit on yes. it. But we found the most success when we were playing through bot side. And that was also true when we had the Bwipo roster. It's like when we were working with Bwipo Hilly upset, it's like we. this was the first time I went to a world championship and I didn't get mm -hmm. sister fisted by every Asian team. You know, we, we scrimmed against Damwon and we went like eight and one. We were completely annihilating them. <laughs> 
okay. Keep going. And, keep hyping me. We, keep hyping uh, me. Go we were, we, like were scrim- we were scrimming against T1, and it's like we went like two and four. We won two games strictly yeah. because we just dominated through bottom side. And at some point, won a it's game not, on stage. No, yeah, we won a game on stage too. It's like in that game, it was also a very bot centric game. But although I think it's T1's like, draft was very bad, right? It means mm-hmm. from the other year though. Uh, yes, yes, this was 2022, but it's just, oh. it, it, it's like it's, at some point you I mean, no, figure out. No, no, uh, yeah, he, sorry. Did you mean last last worlds or the two worlds ago? So, so 2021, ago. we were annihilating. Okay. We were winning like, scrims. We were winning okay. scrims. 2022, right. our scrims are so shit, we weren't winning against oh, any okay, of okay. We were fucking getting. Yes. Like, we were scrimming okay. against DRX. You were 8 1 against 2021 Damon? Yeah, that's why it's nuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, one, the one where the upset never played World, sadly. Oh, yeah. I thought he was talking about last year. No, okay. that's, why it's, that's why it's sick. He was even dominating fucking sure, sure. Damon. Okay, it's like I, I still have those votes. I hope one day I can just like show them. It's like <laughs> what happened in those games is, is fucking beautiful. It's like you had the uh, what's his name? Uh, Ghost was like hiding in the reckless <laughs> bush. Why does he oh. don't? Why does he have those votes saved? Like he makes that sound like he comes home and on his computer instead of porn, there's just a folder of like <laughs> scrim votes 2021, <laughs> and he sums up like, All right, you know what? Fuck it, I'm not doing anything tonight. Like damn one time. <laughs> I bet they're sick though. It sounds awesome. Fair play. <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the the main point though, I think it's just you figure out the best way to play the game. You figure what gives you the most odds, and it's not like, oh, now they're so predictable. They're playing around bottom side. No, you're doing actively things oh. that are good. It's like you're you can you can extract value even if the enemy plays accordingly, and you can punish mistakes, and you can set up for drakes, you can set up for invades. There are plays that you can recreate regardless of what the enemy does against you if you play correctly and draft accordingly. It's not like an enemy team went in the game. Oh, these guys are playing around bottom side. Now we got them figured out. No, oh. it's like you still need to deal with it, right? It's like walking into an MMA fight. It's like this guy has has fucking leg kicks. Now I know it. Now yes, what, what am exactly. I like? Yeah, he's fucking kicking my leg. What am I doing? I knew <laughs> yeah. about it before the fight, but I wish yeah, he still doing that. I know it really hurts. Exactly. I know. <laughs> but I knew about it. Why is it still working? Exactly. You know, it was well, just... here's, here's another thing. How about the fact that Riot has just made the game best to be played around bot since yes. they made Drake super fucking OP in 2020. It's yep. just the best way to play League of Legends. Yep. Agreed. <laughs> like, I feel Drake's like that's all that needs to be said. Like, Drakes are fucking broken. You're supposed to be playing around bot side. Yeah, they're playing around bot side because you're supposed to play around bot side. This is the reason everyone says top is weak and bot's OP. That still applies. Like, I don't know why people don't make the, the connection. People sit there in their solo cubic games, complain about top being weak, and then when upset is playing aggressively through bot, they're like, yeah, they keep on playing through upset, those motherfuckers. Like, how is that a bad thing? Like, you want to play through bot. It's an yes. issue if you don't play through bot. And I'll just throw this out there as one last reason. It's also another one for my video, but it's quick. Basically, here's how you know how hype the potential for this roster is. Especially now you've seen them play. Bro, if they actually do end up being the best team, the joke is the MVP conversation is just like four of their players arguing. <laughs> what? Except for Kaiser, every player could be the MVP on this team in theory. The fuck? Like, that's how stacked this roster is. I think it looks awesome. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, we can't argue too much. It's only three games, but... And it's the potential just looks fantastic. And things well, look like they're clicking right on the gate. Well, if I know anything about LEC, if they end up winning the split, that means that all four of their players will be the four best players in their role. That's just how there it works. Go. The best team always has yes. all the best players. By the way, as an aside, they have ruined all pro voting by including the fucking playoffs as well. Because remember, I always say this, all pros an individual award. The best thing about all pro is in past seasons when someone like Vethio is never going to win the league, you can still go, you know what? Maybe you were the best mid though. There you go. There's your award. If you use the format we use now in past splits, if we'd included playoffs, you could never be first team all pro if you're a Vethio because you're never going to be in the final. So I'll just throw that out there. But I think that was a mistake by LEC. They should have done it after the groups, essentially a bit like what we did in the past. Because after groups, there's only four teams left and you could just, you got a pretty good sample size, I think, of who yeah, the best players were, you know. And it's every thought, weekend except for one. It's five out of the six yes. weekends. Because I did think people like Bo got basically robbed just because they didn't play in the playoffs. Like, okay, apparently because oh, Neon I, was I, bad, I, he's just not allowed to even be a top three pl- jungler. Okay, I guess. Fucking what? Yeah. No, it's, people just removed <laughs> the, the split from their head with, with the bow one. Like, it's crazy to just... To, to say, oh, when oh, you saw those like votes, left. dude, he had like yeah. six votes for all pro. Six. Only six people voted poor. Yeah, if people don't know, look, sick. I know I hype him to the roof, but I think it's fucking unbelievable, man, that player. <laughs> yeah, he's he's super good. And then like the games, that, like what are you even criticizing about him? He plays games with his bot lane getting absolutely fucking 
destroyed where they're losing turn at nine minutes and somehow you're going to turn around and tell me like, oh, Malrong's a better jungler than him. Are we watching the same oh, game? That's right. Yeah, they voted Malrong in just because just because Koi came third. Malrang got fucking all pro. That's a no, that's I don't, a did he get all pro? Mar 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 Marcoon was third. Oh, no, was he, he didn't didn't get fourth? Also, but, but he was ahead he of more votes than Bo is my right. point. Yeah, he definitely yeah, was, he, yeah. He got more votes votes than Bo, which I thought was was super so weird considering what happened in the games. Like, sure, the game two, he plays Nidalee and he's trying to gank bot and his bot lane dives level one. And then when he tries to gank it, one of his laners is dead. It's like, sure, he shouldn't gank it and he should just like accept that they're going to lose the game and just like farm his jungle to make himself look good instead of trying anything. I guess that that would be a better thing if, you, if you're playing for all pro votes. But like, let's be realistic with what we saw. What about the SK series? The first game, he completely takes over the game on Elise. They're up 8k. They lose oh, that game. The second game, he plays card. This whole game is impossible to play. I don't know what people are looking at where they're like, like, Bo is actually the fifth best jungler in Elise. Just imagine thinking that he's the fifth best jungler. Even if you just, even if you don't use any of, like, accomplishments, you don't, you don't care about his mechanics or anything, you just look at the games, I still don't even think it's fair. When you look at the games that were played, like, what, for the first seven games, he was by far the best jungler in the league. And then after that, he had a series versus Heretics where he smurfed games on Kindred. Oh, he, he like fine, won yeah. them. He, he won them games. Then he had a fucking good game versus SK. The Sejuani game that he played, like what what can you do on Sejuani if your bot lane loses a turn in nine minutes? Actually, what, what what the fuck do you do? And then you have like two bad Vi games like at the end of the season once they had already qualified for, for the next stage. You have a Nidalee game where the game is lost level one and a Karthus game where he can never play. Like what what are we actually criticizing him? I think you're a pro believer, you might all. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm giga hyped on Bo. Like I, all I did uh, before the season started was just watching his Champions Q, watching his every stream. Very intriguing player, super exciting. Like it's it's very clear that he's something special. I would say, you know, it, it is hard sometimes to to judge players because in the end there is limited potential in what the game gives you based of what your teammates are doing, what the enemies are doing. I think like another conversation is like Jankos on Team Heretics. I think last split he was playing really fucking well. He was killing well. it, he? Yeah. He, was, he yeah. was creating well leads that that no one could fucking convert. This weekend too yep. played fucking well. Uh, like uh, even in that conversation, is like he's so limited by the potential that his team gives him because they are not converting any leads. They're not converting anything. He's played many different champions. I think that's always so tricky. What when when you judge a jungler based off performance, not based off of how good they are as a player. Like, I think that's the contrast. Like, if I'm judging the players based off of, if I'm creating a roster and I, my goal is to just get the best possible players in each position, it would be very, very different than what I would vote in terms of what they actually manage to do in uh, in the games because you are severely limited by your teammates uh, in terms of what your potential yeah, is. That, I factor that into performance. If you can't make a play because your teammates are, are, are fucking up, I'm not going to hold that against you as a player and be like, oh, yeah, well, yeah. like, Yankos is bad because he's not winning or something like no, that like course. he just has I think less he means stuff. team performances when he says performance well no but i mean do you mean team performance or do you mean like individual like performance I, I, like think, the results, oh, I, I think i think it's like if if at the end of uh, a split you want to like rate top three jungle or like top three in any position i think jungle is probably like the most difficult one because you are limited by your what your team gives you i think yankos played fucking good i think marcoon yeah. played well i think elioya was like insanely consistent because because Bo had like I remember the the game against XL and the game against BDS like his vibe performance like those two games were really really terrible from a Bo standpoint. Yeah. I think the Nidalee game and the Carters game I don't fucking I mean, blame him but, because but what, in what the about end. Okay, but like for Marcoon, right? Like the first two games of the split were horrible games. You remember his first two yeah, games? Yeah, I, I didn't. Time? I didn't like, put Marcoon on third. Just, those are two fucking games in the same spring split that you're judging. So that's like, well, that's what I don't fuck with. Because if you look at the other seven, Bo was like, okay, both of them into super fucking hard two games. Yes, yes. Like, and then you look at the other seven and Bo is like significantly better than, than Marcoon in the other seven that they play. And then when they play against each other, it's like a one, one in terms of like, who's playing better in jungle. That's what I don't fuck with when it comes to yeah, like yeah, this yeah. type of like line of no, reasoning, that, because I, I can relate to that for sure. I think, I think putting Bo minimum third makes a lot of fucking sense for sure. I, I think if you put that in that context, Marcoon also had some real shit games. I think even against Koi, right? I think Malrang really yep. made him look bad. And then in he the did. end, like they didn't know how to really execute on that game. It's like, I am probably one of the few people that liked Malang's performance in, in winter because I, every game I see him getting first blood, I see him getting kills, but his teammates are just not converting. So I was like, I, I liked what Malang was doing in the context of what the meta was and him defining like level three ganks. Like, I think almost every single game, I saw him getting a kill, getting a kill again, and then it just was completely meaningless in the context of what Koi did. So I, I liked what Malang did, but 
I think putting both third makes makes perfect sense if you put it in the context of where did these players have actual bad games. And I think Mark Hunter definitely had some really horrible Vi games. I think the series against Koi was also bad, but he also had some really, really good games. And I, 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 I don't know, always when it comes to these votings, I think players are putting so much weight in terms of what they saw in scrims and what they see. Oh, for and, sure. yes. and it's like, oh, this guy ganked me and <laughs> fucked me and that's why I'm going to rate him higher. You know, they, 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 if the players look at the lens through, through their perception of playing against them. But to be fair, I don't know who voted what. Like, I remember looking at the votings. I saw some egregious shit. Uh, I have, like, taken it out of my memories because always looking at the voting. This person is the third best for you? Kaiser? Kaiser was the, the third best opponent, super for you? Oh, okay. Okay, come on, man. That was a bit sus. We won't say who that was, but that was, that was <laughs> I a little bit disappointing. Who that was. You don't because you'll you'll get so upset if you see who it is, Dom. So don't, don't just leave who, it out. who is it? Who is it? Just it tell up. me. I'm gonna go look anyway. Should I say it, Yamato? Well, I don't want to say it. You can say it. <laughs> but it is sweet. It was someone who appears on the broadcast voted Kaiser third. In fact, there was even someone on the broadcast who I believe actually put, I think, something mad like a player from their country, top three, who definitely wasn't top three. There was there was a few sus ones, put it that way. Again, you can look yes. it up, Dom. You can look it up. You can look it up. It's all right. I already flamed people on broadcast enough, mate. I, I, I'll take the ones I really care about. I'll do a whole video on that one. Right, let's spin the stock. Since he brought it up, Dom, he can't, we're not going to allow him to come on to the best damn lead show and say that he really enjoyed how Malran played jungle last split and then just <laughs> leave it there. Like, with that, It's definitely going to be, you know, let's just segue to that, Dom. So come on. Because here's the thing. I thought he was a bit sus last split, but I also think this split looks fucking terrible. Like, yeah, this split what, looks what, fucking horrible. What's your talk? What's your take? Like, what would your counter to... Like, look, here's a fucked up thing. As a coach, I can see why he might like some things about Marag, but I think there's so many flaws, though, right? I mean, I think he's, just, Dom, come on. He's, he's one of the, the least efficient junglers I've ever seen. And it's not even a, a, like a term of, oh, is he prioritizing like ganking over farming? It's right. even though he's ganking, the way that he uses the gold that he gains, the times where he like could be ganking at a certain timer and he won't actually like, he won't hit the timer properly and he'll just be there like 30 seconds early where he could have farmed two camps. I feel like all this stuff is, is really bad from him. So I just, the reason I don't really like Morong as a jungler is I just feel like he puts his team behind with how behind he, he puts himself intentionally, you know, like the team can't do the things that they should do because he buys weird fucking items. Like that's, that's another thing is like, even after Cleaver was buffed, everyone was just going Cleaver, right? It's like, oh, it's the same item, and now it's just fucking broken. And then he's still going the Chainsword, no matter what. So he's buying wrong items. He was overbuying Pig Wars before. He's kind of cleaned that up to some degree. Um, but I just think that, like, the team would benefit a lot more from having somebody who is actually efficient in the jungle. Like, they have, like sure, he, he does aggressive things, but he doesn't do them at good times. I feel like that's the difference between somebody like him and somebody like... Yankos, for example, where Yankos ganks a fuck ton and he hits good timers, but he also like knows how many camps he needs to do before he goes to that timer. Um, so, yeah, I just, I just don't like the way Maorong plays. I think that he just plays the game poorly as a jungler. Let me put it to you this way, Yamato. I remember it might even have been on this show. I think it was the crackdown, maybe, where you made that interesting analogy where you said it was when you were coaching Sandbox. You said that you see the game as like there's two like potential columns. You're either going for like activity, so it's like LPL style, which you're going to increase like the amount of like roams, ganks, skirmishes. But in doing so, you're going to lose some of the precision. Was the premise? I think was the other one you had right. So you're either going. I mean, the the good analogy obviously is LPL versus LCK traditionally. LCK goes more towards precision and like a very simplified game plan that plays out correctly. LPL's more like increase the activity level a lot and then let's see who can sort of thrive in the chaos, you know. I could see in this world that Malran for using the activity side of it. Like, I'm with you on that. I think even Dom agrees. Like, the ganks and the activity can be good. The problem I would ask you is this, Yamato. Do you not have any issue with, like, first of all, as he alluded to, the joke is Malrang so ahead of the meta. He was doing this whack shit the Korean supports do with the pink wards, a bloody jungle. But last year, he was just buying pink wards all the time and just delaying his items. And then also, he is also notorious for just not building the fucking items. You know, he keeps building like another ruby crystal into some other non item, you know, like, do, do these parts not bother you? Like these sort of weird inefficiencies in the game? No, I, I agree wholeheartedly with uh, with uh, Dom's take uh, on it. I think there's definitely occasions where he's overwhelmingly greedy uh, to, to, to create 
uh, something. Like the main thing for me is like, I, I remember how Malang was as a player before he arrived to Europe. And I think that uh, this identity was developed through what he saw the other teams were doing and how he could find ways to punish and also through the lens of what his team is. I think that um, when, when Koi won, um, what was good about them is that they had laners that could convert leads. And when these laners couldn't pressure, uh, they died to ganks and they fell behind and they could, didn't really know how to, to play the game from that point. And I think that, that Malrang uh, eventually, at least in scrims, it's like uh, we played against Koi many times where they tried to play like Diana jungle or like jungles that were farming and, and Malrang was farming, but everybody else was dying. And, and I could see how they eventually got to that point where the only way they function is if they create advantages in their lanes and then play out the game in a very patterned manner where uh, Larson is on a, on a, on a control mage and the bot lane is, is, uh, is finding ways to, to pick champions like the Soraka and they are allowed to play and uh, breathe and uh, find advantages. And then eventually they get to the point where everything is just about the fights and everything is very streamlined. I think that Malran uh, committed to this idea. I think definitely there's circumstances where it's like very, very inefficient. And I think the main thing for me, what I enjoyed about what I saw in the winter split, even though I agree that there is the sentiment of very, very extreme inefficiency that can be heavily punished by teams that are stronger. I think that uh, he did manage to find advantages for his teammates, even in games that they lost that his teammates struggled to convert. So I saw the same Malrang in winter that I saw the previous split that helped Koi win. But I think that uh, the individual performances of the rest of his roster isn't on par with what we saw when they actually won. I also think that the competition is much harsher because I do believe when Koi won the split, Fnatic, even though we were not that strong of a team, we were very one dimensional. G2 as well, like they couldn't play Yumi, they couldn't play Lucian, they weren't a strong G2 to beat when they won the split. So inherently this idea is very flawed and I agree with that sentiment completely that the way of playing the game like that is flawed, but just in winter, I just rate it based off of how effective it was, rather over the idea of how good it actually is always. Right? And I think that's the two lines. I think if, if you try to play that way over and over again, I think that those demons are going to catch up to you when teams get better. Gets exposed eventually, right? yes. For sure. Yes. So, so I, I understand that line of thinking 100%. Your points, Dom, I think they make perfect sense. Just in winter, I think there was games where, I remember like Maokai, he managed to get level 3 gank on mid, he got killed for Azir, and then there was, he predicted a dive on top and sacked camps, and then he, uh, the team is like 2-0, Azir is 2-0, and then they just don't convert at all. And I, I remember many games like that where Malan created advantages, but it just didn't matter at all in the grand scheme of things. And I do have to add now in spring, I think that he looks very bad. Like the three games that he played, I didn't think he played good at all. The other thing I wanted to pivot to on Koi, I thought this is the other topic is because like uh, to, to fill you in on the last split, we already did too many episodes about Shigenda's problems. Though, so we've already sort of talked that one to death. Hasn't changed much. So I think, Dom, the real topic for discussion in Koi, aside from Malrang, is what the fuck has happened to their bot lane? Bro, the worst thing is not only was their bot lane one of their main strengths when they won the league last year, but also on paper, they should have the meta locked up. They can play all the Lucian army and all that shit. Like, they just look bad, though. Like, Comp just looks like he's just like, as his champion pulls died or something. Like, what's happened to this guy? Like, he just looks so, like, they're just behind in most of these lanes now, bro. Like, I don't know what's going on. What are your thoughts, Dom? What's, what's going wrong with this team? Because I feel like once the bot lane disappears, they have nothing now, mate. They don't have the top laner anymore, weak sider. Larson, at the end of the day, his whole strength is, like, prop the team up. Like, he's the skeleton of the team. He's not the guy who pops off and carries and 1v9s the game. Like, it's not his game. So, to me, they just look like a very neutered coy. Yeah, I mean, if they were bad last season in Lulu, Zeri, Lucia, Nami meta. How are they going to operate now where they were never the best team when it was actually just engaged supports, right? Trimby was fine in engaged supports, but his big strength over the other top supports in Europe, like Kaiser, for example, when Kaiser was on top, or Mickey X or Hilly, his main advantage, Trimby's main advantage was that he was the guy that could actually play the enchanters. He yes. could play 
the Enchanter. You can play the range support. You can play things like Soraka. They had a bunch of like niche counter picks. So if you took Enchanters away from them, they'd play like Cal a Callista Soraka. So they would have the ability to save the Soraka. And now it's just not the same. Like they just, they're still trying to do this, but they have to do it with different champions. And then you just have a Soraka walking around that's like able to get engaged on and die. So I feel very weird watching uh, Koi play because I don't know what happened to them last split. I don't know if they just took a big break or they weren't playing as much. Um, I know that that like Shigenda said half jokingly on the broadcast that uh, last split or that they took too much time off and now they kind of sucked or like they're not like playing as well as as whatever. And he said it half jokingly, but it's like one of those half jokes that has an element of truth. Um, yeah, w within it. It's weird to watch them play. I wonder like if they're still grinding the game the same way that they did before, what their mentality is after winning um, and how much like these regular season games really mean to them, because it does seem like they are a team that is like chilling in the game. Like it doesn't seem like they have that sense of urgency. They're willing to just do nothing and lose. And that's like pretty sad to watch. Yeah, I, I would add as well that um, in, in, in the context of like their success last year, I think they did things that put them uh, ahead of uh, the curve, I think the the whole approach in terms of how everyone approaches early game is something that everyone has been a lot more uh, attuned to because of how the jungle changed and almost every jungler right before the, the changes was just ganking level three, pressuring level three. That was pretty much the, the whole meta, right? And I think their bot lane is definitely on an individual basis underperforming and they've grown to rely on that. I think that Inherently, I think this this roster is trying to replicate the same thing that they did last split uh, last year. But I think that everything around them has changed too much. Like a lot of other bot lanes have gotten a lot better. Uh, the context of what Jongo needs to do and how mid lane connects to that is also very different. An additional layer that I would add as well is Koi had splits. Where, or, or weekends where they looked very, very bad due to a very poor meta read. And I think that something that Rogue always did was I could, moving into the matches against them, I could predict the changes in terms of how they're going to approach draft based off of what happens globally. Uh, they, they always kind of tuned in to whatever's happening globally and they applied those same ideas. And then I, you could kind of predict what's coming. And I think in the current format, in terms of how the patches and the, the frequency of patches, you, you can't really rely on connecting your ideas to what's happening globally and adapt that as as quickly because patches change and there's, you know, you don't have that time to 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 rebuild your momentum. And I think this also hurts uh, Rogue's or Koi's, whatever the fuck, Koi's ability to 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 adapt and to to create an idea that works. If Koi is going to play well again, I think they live and die uh, by the performance of their bot lane. They need to perform a lot better. I think Co Comp and Trimby individually are fantastic players, but currently they are not performing as good because I don't think Shigenda, Malrang or Larsen are going to be catalysts or, or engines for what is uh, a successful Koi team. Yeah, I mean, they also are them copying people around the world is actually pretty bad in a lot of contexts because a lot of things just don't fit into what makes Koi good. So for example, one of the things they obviously picked up around the world was the Gragas, the Gragas mid. And maybe yep. they also, you know, got it from playing against Niski, whatever. Maybe it came from, from direct, um, you know, competition. But the point is, you can look at a game where Koi is playing a fucking Gragas mid and you're like, yeah, they fucking lost. How are they ever going to win with Gragas mid Lee Sin? The whole idea of Gragas mid Lee Sin, like which originally came from T1, was the fact that you would be able to get all these kills. Like, you'd just be able to dive mid and use that pressure and go roam in side lanes. That's the opposite of a Koi game, guys. Like, that is yes. that is not how Koi wants to operate at all. So a lot of their drafts just make no sense. Like, they're just trying to do different things. Think about the draft that they had um, in the game versus Mad Lions, where they draft Draven Soraka. The fuck is Draven Soraka? Just think about those two champions in a lane together. They are actually complete opposites. The Kalista Soraka kind of worked because Soraka could be really OP. And then giving the, the Kalista ult to the Soraka, the same reason that Kalista can be played support. It's like Kalista is fine in lane. And then you also have the ability to save the Soraka. Soraka can be really OP in the game then. Draven Soraka makes no sense, especially when you're pairing it with like Sejuani Silas, which is trying to go in. And then you have a Jace to poke where it's like nothing else can really poke. It's just so weird what they're doing. So I feel like a lot of their drafts are really anti-thematic. And a lot of it just comes from people playing comfort picks and things that they think are are good for their lane, but they don't really think about how it's interacting with each other. Um, and yeah, I mean, all three games looked bad, right? Like the Koi game, 
look, they play against any other top laner besides for Evie, and he gets a lead on Trindamir like that. It's not going to look the same. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Unless it's Oscar, maybe. That, like, I just feel like their drafts just don't make sense, and they're they're lucky that they, they went one and two, and they really only went one and two because they played one of the bottom two teams in the league. 100%. You, you, you can see uh, this pattern in every team when they are, they don't know anything, they don't feel comfortable on the meta, and they feel behind, then they're beginning to just slam things that, feel, that strike them as comfortable. I think you could see that in Fnatic. Uh, you could see that in 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 koi as well where they're just trying to just pick things oh we won on this in the past let's just you're, you're comfortable in this champ let's pick it you can see that in like koi them they are probably the only team that is picking a uh, full top side one two three it's like oh we get jay sejuani silas all of you guys are comfortable on those champs we don't take any risks and then uh, you'll figure something out uh, four five uh, uh, koi bot lane uh, good luck to you guys if we pivot and talk, like, I thought we don't have to spend much time on them, but one team I want to big up is obviously Astralis. Like, not only did they surprise people by doing better in the groups than people thought, like, they were supposed to come last place in the group, if you remember. But I, if you look, this split, dude, all the games this split are good so far. Like, not only did they win big games, even the one they lost was, like, a good fucking game against SK. And I've got to say this, right? You know my joke back in the day? It was actually to diss Kobe a little bit. As I used to say back in the day, the reason I wasn't that impressed by Kobe in, like, Splice era is because he was reckless light. The joke is now fucking reckless is Kobe light, mate. Kobe is a stud. This guy's fucking balling in all these games. Like, he's also just changed as a player. Like, mate, he's way more aggressive than I ever remember. And then you also look at this team, like, look, yeah, obviously the leader factor. But everyone knows, like, he's going to have some games where he just stomps and he goes off, etc. I'm probably, I'm sort of waiting. I've seen enough of leaders career. I'm waiting for the games that are bad when they look really terrible and he picks, like, a fucking Yone and doesn't do anything. That's going to happen eventually. But, like, Astralis seem to be punching way above their weight because I still think some of their rosters sus as fuck, mate. Like, I think some of that, I won't say the names here because I'm bigging them up, but some of the players up, let's say, more the top side of them are pretty fucking shit as far as I'm concerned. But this, <laughs> okay. Copy is a stud, mate. And as long as the game is bot centric, you can win gear. You can win BO1s at least if you're Astralis, mate. This is yeah. this just uh, mad props to Copy for just turning his career around right at the end. Oh, it's amazing what happens when your mid isn't perma fucking losing. When your mid that isn't helps. permanently <laughs> dying like five times a fucking lane phase and down 100 CS, it's amazing how much more stable the game looks. Crazy. Who would have thought? Uh, you think you're mortal? I, I think Kobe, you know, I had the pleasure of working with him in, in his rookie year. And uh, it's like the first split, you know, we, we worked with uh, a different player. And then the second split, you know, we found Mickey and Kobe and Mickey were fucking good. You know, they yeah, played yeah. so fucking well together. And uh, in the end, we lost against uh, Sven and Mithy. And that is like, fine, you know, that's like, you know, good. It's like we won one game in the final and that was back off of a, like a fantastic uh, severe Kobe performance. Uh, and I think... Uh, throughout his year, throughout throughout his career, you know, he's been matched with 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 supports that I don't really think of as super super strong laners. Like he worked with Ture, he worked with Kassing, and um, was it Biofrost in in North America? Yeah. Uh, and they, you know, the whole North American story was not the greatest. I just feel like this pairing with Kobe and Yonghoon, ever since they started playing together like the, that bot lane has some serious teeth. Like even in, 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 in the winter split, when they went, when they lost every game in a row, like every game they were 2v2 killing bot, like every game they were 2v2 killing bot, but they just had players that uh, Finn at the time would just completely lose his mind. Like there was like a fucking alarm clock is I have to end. And then he just fucking went and did some dumb shit. Uh, Dior was like always, always, you know, dying to gangs, dying to, to, to circumstance that should, shouldn't happen if, if you manage the wave appropriately. And I think 113 was like on and off. I think now with the addition of leader, it's I think- a ridiculous analogy, the idea like he's in bed like, oh, I'm putting up and get up and in. Legit, I have no <laughs> way of explaining it otherwise. Like it legit is like, oh, he's, he's really doing off. really well in the game. And then just, oh, I have to dive the turret and die. And it's like, what the fuck just happened? And I think he's, he's doing a lot better. I think leader as a player, like watching him in Champions queue, he is very, very, good at tuning into where you can find value within the game. Uh, I think he's very good at recognizing when he can get value around mid and pulling teammates to him. Uh, where it's like, oh, I'm slow pushing this wave. We've set up for a dive here. The enemy needs to defend and then we can take over the map. Or when he sees, oh, there's a situation, one with three can invade. I'm just going to support him and just tune into the game. I think this is how leader picks his champions. And I think this is also how leader uh, plays the game. Like in Champions League, I saw him picking Viego mid and he's doing exactly that. Just pushing the waves making sure that he's in tune with what his jungler is doing. And I think this is super, super good because 
this Astralis bot lane was getting advantages almost every fucking game that they were playing. And now that they get support from their jungle and their mid laner, and these players can tune into what they're doing, they are seriously, you know, developing like a very unique identity in the league. I think it's very good to see that it's very clear that everyone's in line about contesting the 3v3 mid, because I think the main thing that made them so competitive and them beating G2 was them being very aware of how the wave state is going to translate into what G2 wants to do next. And I think there was many circumstances where leader read Mickey, and I think Mickey is usually the point person that is going to kind of reveal to you what the plan of G2 is. And he read them super well, picked them off a couple of times. I think in that game, G2 misplayed a lot of team fights because in the end, they need to play around the K to add a massive advantage because the lane matchup was good. And they kept engaging forward the Kled and the Mal fight and so forth, when in reality, they just need to play around the I think G2 made it a little bit easier, but all in all, I think this new identity for Astralis makes them an outlier within the league where teams need to actually be good at competing around the 2v2 and the 3v3 mid. And then uh, with that, I think in the context of the current meta, playing those fast games, early game heavy compositions is actually very good because you can convert the game into a win in 22 to 24 minutes if you play on Soul Point. And that is a trend that we see everywhere. So I think this new version of Astralis, I, I, I like it super much. And I think leader is awkward enough that you need to think twice before you face up against uh, uh, at Astralis. And I think that's so important. If you're at the bottom of the standings, take yes. some fucking risks yes. and make yourself as awkward as possible. Like 2018 Vitality, we knew Fnatic on paper was fucking amazing. So we, we made sure we're gonna be as far away as Fnatic as possible. And we're gonna be yes. fucking weird. When they practice on the week before they play us, this shouldn't be fucking helpful at all to them because we're going to be fucking awkward. We're going to gang caps level two, level three. We're going to fuck them up. We're going to be weird. And I think that's fantastic. I think any team uh, lower in the standings needs to take risk like this. And I think leader is kind of, you know, the special source. Yes. By the way, I do just appreciate the idea that, like, for Finn, he has that, like, meme dom. You know, where the guy's like, oh, my gosh, would you look at the time? But, like, every time on the clock, it's like, int. It's just like, int, 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 int. Oh, well, <laughs> oh, better get in there. And then also on the leader angle, I'm with you on that one, by the way. I've always said, Yamato, the ones that, I, it's one thing if a top team doesn't want to gamble on leader, they're worried about the meta or whatever. I agree with you. If you're, like, the worst teams, by the way, the two players, I'll even throw your old boy in. Leader and Suzuki would be my yeah, number one pick. If yeah. I am one of the worst teams in the league, just throw that guy in because crucially, their upside is that they have high variance and could just win you a game and pop off. The joke is if you are if you have the worst LEC team, you don't want to sign like Magic Felix or something. Even if he has a good game, his style isn't suited to 1v9 the game. He's just going to be stable. It's like having Larson, you know, you wouldn't want that play on the worst team. It's not going to give you wins. I'm with you though, because here, they've looked into, this is almost the perfect time to bring Leader in as well. If you look at the mid lane meta, he can actually just play some of his jumping straight up they're not even shit picks like some of the ones he wants to play are good and actually you have to always with leader respect the adam factor we talked about with like the darius one tricks and the olafs when you play against his yone or whatever you're not playing the normal yone that you're like right what's the um go quickly google what's the counter to you like, he knows all the counters you idiot like it's not a counter when you play it in fact he even knows you can pick that and he's if he even picks it in the game he's expecting you might pick the counter except hey, the problem is you've probably played that matchup like a half a dozen times he's probably played it 50 times like he's gonna actually have the edge on you I'm, I'm with you on that one you might even think he can make like the off meta picks work if he wants so if you're on the worst team why not gamble the problem is though like you can only go so far with this you can win some bo ones but this team's gonna have a hard time again when we get to groups yeah they'll definitely have a hard time when when they get to groups but leader is one of the players that he he understands his matchups to the level where it will give the team the direction they need. So, for example, in the game versus, versus Caps, Caps mega disrespected him. The fact that he went Ignite and he didn't go TP in that lane when it's already, like, not a, a super winning lane early, that fucked him so hard because once, you know, he 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 bases, right? He bases at a bad time. He's trying to shove in the wave. Leader can actually freeze the wave on him. He knows that that Mickey and Yike have to go mid. He knows that they have to three-man crash this wave. But if he just calls his team at the same time, he just keeps the freeze. And it, it just it's just winning for the rally from that point on. So... I think that that they get this win through like good team play, but then also G2 like played very disrespectfully. I don't think that we're going to see, you know, games like crucial games that matter later down the line. We're going to see Malphite mid with Ignite into into lanes like this. I think Caps will normally just play things that can do the same thing, but also can do them from like a safer distance. And even if he does pick the Malphite, he'll just bring TP. So I think that's a that's a big thing. And then also 
uh, Astralis is probably not getting Sejuani for the rest of the split because Sejuani just enables all the melee mid laners to come out. And I think the teams are going to start being very cynical about the way that they draft first uh, versus leader. We're seeing it right now versus OMG. And, you know, uh, because they're so similar, I know leader is, has made jokes about how he's kind of like cream from, from OMG. Because they are they also both play fucking all hardcore all in his all Yeah, they're, they're all, they're hardcore all inners. They both play a bunch of melee mid laners. Fun yes. fact, I keep on dropping this on stream, but I, maybe some people haven't heard it here. Leader's name when, uh, from watching OMG last year, his name that he chose in solo queue was OMG cream pie. That's what he was going by. Jesus. So. <laughs> yeah, you have to remember he is Norwegian. If you don't know, by the way, like scans have their own naughty sense of humor. Spoiler, just go look at the, all the people who've been banned in league history who were pros. A lot of Scandinavians <laughs> in that mix, I'm telling you. So. That's, <laughs> a, that's a bit... Come on, bro. Especially also, by the way, when you have like a low key rep that like you're supposed to be toxic, <laughs> maybe don't make your solo queue pawn terms, you know. Like, maybe just keep it brand safe later. Just saying, you know. He's just a fan of OMG Cream, and you know, OMG Cream was taken, so he had to go with something else. But uh yeah, I mean I, I think that it, that it's good for them to have this identity. I, I I'm not sure if they'll go as as high as they did last year. Like, do they win a best of or do they make it to the final best of three? Um in order Probably to make not, right? the playoffs. Probably not, because the thing that you have to consider about last year is that they were so lucky that Finn was coin flipping the good Finn at the right time. That almost never happens, right? If you go through history, when you go into playoffs, a lot of times that's when Finn is playing some of his worst games. So I feel like Finn is, is still a, a wild card. And if he's not feeling it when you get to playoffs, you just you might have just the 10th best top laner in the league. Yes. So uh, that's cool. For, yeah, go on. I just wanted to say, I think like having them like sixth, I think that's like fair to me. You know, sixth, I think there, you know, I think maybe they could like beat out BDS in the best of three. I think that's where I yeah. would like place them, you know? Yeah. And then I think all the teams above them would be like the, the MAD and the SK and the G2 and the VIT. And I think these teams would just be more uh, consistent. Because I think the SK game was a good example of when the 2v2 goes wrong. It's like the Lee Sin got 2 0 1 after that situation. And I think the game is kind of over because. Is very feast of famine the way they're they're going to draft uh, in regards to their game. If immediate champions are behind, they can only fight their way through situations. Every wave that you're pushing out is going to be uh, dangerous, and uh, I think SK did a good job of of, of matching that. And like that game, Leeson was on Gore Drinker at eight, at eight minutes. It's like wherever Leeson is, you're going to lose. So you you know that the enemy needs to fight their way out, and uh, their games are either going to be like good snowballs or they're going to like lose very very fast uh, down to the three v three around mid. Yeah. Here, here's another thing. I don't, I don't know if you know this, Thorne. Did you know that Cream's name before it was Cream was actually Crime? I feel like that's such a fucking sick okay. name. OMG Crime. That's baller, like, yeah. That is like one of the best <laughs> names. I, I fucking, yes. I don't know. I love that stupid ass. Here's team. the thing, Dom. Yeah, Last damn. time I saw a Crime in the mid lane, it was Bjergsen taking that check from Team Liquid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, though. It's all right. We don't have to go on about that too I much. You're gonna just, it only haunts Steam on its extremes. You're not going to no. say Deor's entire winter split? Like, you, 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 okay, all right. I just prefer to get this a shot in on Bjergsen. Just why not? Fuck him, right? All right, daily Bjergsen flight. I mean, all I'm going to say is this. The best mid laner on 100 Thieves is the fucking coach. Put Nuke Duck in. Get Bjergsen the fuck out there. Nuke Duck knows what a wave is and how to play off it, motherfucker. He's not going to sit under the tower. Bloody <laughs> hell. You, the way Bjergsen's career has gone the last few years, Dom, his favorite fucking Lord of the Rings must be the two towers. <laughs> I can do this all day long. So anyway, let's get back to LEC, boys. It's not the roast of Bjergsen right now, you might, even though it did verge into that for a second. I could do that all day. You have to understand, it's like work for me, mate. So <laughs> I, let's go back, because what some of the teams I am interested to ask about are the ones where, a bit like SK, maybe you wondered, did they overperform last split? One that I do think is going to, like, I think this is the sobering split, unfortunately, is BDS. Like, they looked so good, but they were the ones, obviously, if people remember, who got that loss to Astralis when they were supposed to win and all the jazz. You know, like, I think if you look at this team, like, look, Crowdy still cracked. Looks really great still. Labrov even, I'll give him props again. He's having a much better year than he did in past years. He's leveled his game up. But beyond that, like, when I look at the league, if I tell it he's going to be stronger, and we're assuming Excel's at least going to go, like, 50% or something in this split. Koi's not great, but they still probably should be better. The problem with them is, like, I think, even if, even if it, BDS was the same team as last split that they have to drop down it feels like they have to be like a bottom group team again like i don't really see how they can be a yeah. challenger whereas i'll say this right now i do think they are the team that blew their window last split dude last split they were actually looking like they had an outside chance to maybe even make a run into the playoffs you know in that group they were looking actually quite interesting and then they sort of just had the shittest last series you could have and just blew it so do you, you want to go first on this dom what you take what's your take on bds what's your read on them 
I mean, I, I feel I feel the same way, but that's already like pretty decent. I, I think if they're able oh, it to, is. yeah. I mean, if they're able to once again get into the group stage, I mean, it's it's almost guaranteed, right? Their first game is against Fnatic, right? Once if they beat yes. Fnatic, that's that's already three and one. They, the they problem already is though, I feel they, essentially this is the problem, Dom. I I know what you mean from an org perspective. That's fine, but like if I'm like Crown Shop, for example, it's like I can't have two splits in a row where I'm just smurfing and we can't we don't even have a chance to win. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's probably it's probably fine from the the crowdy point of view because he was he was like relegated to academy. At least now people are like, That's oh true. shit! Like he's actually a fucking good AD carry. He's somebody who deserves to be in LEC perpetually until we see something else. Like, oh, maybe maybe in five years there's a new generation of AD carries that comes up. Maybe in two years, who who the fuck knows? But right now, he's definitely one of the best ten AD oh, carries in Europe. Good. And he should definitely be in, in, in these teams. There's there's about five eighty carries in the league that should be removed before somebody like Crowney. And maybe somebody like like Crowney in his career, maybe he finally gets an opportunity to play in one of the fucking good teams. That's the problem with Crowney's career. Yes. He's always just been in these like mid-level teams and people there's always been, you know, a ch changeover where people were taking somebody like Comp over him. Whereas like now when you're looking at Koi, I mean, I would rather have Crowney than 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 Comp with how how games are going. I want to see him get a get a chance where he can actually prove himself. I feel like yes. the fact that he does get caught is something that will always kind of kind of make teams stray away from him because they're like oh shit like if he gets caught we might lose an entire game but there's so many positives how about the fact that he's just winning lane like yes. he's consistently winning lane like that fucking matters that fucking matters more than more than your late game in half the games you have people like Karzu who's also getting caught and who's on a better team like i don't yeah. know i i just i'm i'm hoping that this is like good for the players that uh th that i like on that team i think lebrov has had that opportunity before it doesn't seem like he's a big team player but for, for BDS, if they're able to prove that they're just not a bottom two team, that's a big step for the organization. And I think that for like the players on the team, it's all big because these are these are players that were at risk. All of these players were at risk of just losing their, their careers in LEC, just being relegated to LFL for like the rest of their lives. Yes. By the way, put Crowdy in that box that we were talking about before, you about of the players that you sign if you're a bottom team. Dude, if you want to talk about the idea of like, you know, that upset thing of like, oh, he took resources. If you have Crown Shot on your team, you should give him resources. He's really good. What are you talking about? Like, he carries the game. He even did that on SK all those years ago when that team was just whack as fuck. It's just him and Limit just like solo carrying the game. Like, what yeah. do you think of this BDS team, you matter? Where you at? Uh, I feel like their bot lane is, is very strong. I think they generate uh, a lot of good leads on the bottom side. I think Adam, I think that he has become a lot better as a player. I think in the past, uh, when, when I worked with him, you know, the main thing that we always, uh, you know, had to repeat over and over again, it just didn't latch on, was just how he connects with his team when he has advantages, uh, how he sets up his waves in a way where he doesn't get ganked and how he kind of is in tune with everything that is happening in the game. You know, this was always the issue that... He was always playing very, very isolated, and uh, even when he had advantages, he would like uh, never uh, hover into mid to control River and leverage his advantage. He would always be like pushing past River, dying to the enemy that took control over River, and this would just repeat itself. And I think uh, at least now, even in the cases where they're playing Flash and Ghost, he's finding better ways to connect. But I feel, I feel like BDS's macro it resembles a lot of what I see in the ERL the ERLs. Um, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's are, not a are, good thing, by the way. Uh, are like, I think in terms of lane phase, I think that their bot lane and, and top lane can definitely compete. So they're actually generating game states uh, that uh, should be you know, you should be able to convert those into wins in the context of, of, of Europe. And that's always the start, right? Can you actually like play the early game? And I think they can, but I think the issue always comes later. I think that the way they set up for dragons is always um, uh, very, very late. I don't think they pay attention to how they should... Um, approach objectives, which space is important, from which angles they need to take over things, how they leverage advantages into pressuring Nasher appropriately. And uh, even when they have Nasher, I think the way they convert this is also not super, super clean. And I think uh, this is where the main issue lies. It's like even when they have big advantages, there's always this concern that they're going to be able to throw it because in the end, I think that, um, you know, that the main issue is just how they set up around objectives, how they convert Nasher into an advantage in terms of which lanes they open on and how they play together as a team. I think this is where uh, they, they miss the mark and this is where a lot of improvement can happen. An additional concern that hasn't been, you know, 
uh, glaringly obvious just yet, but I think it will be potentially as this split progresses. I don't see how a uh, nuclear int Sheo Labrov 3v3 mid contention yeah. will <laughs> spread to yeah. the rest of the map. That is like my oh, main concern. Yeah. I don't know how, if they can't play through their side lanes, if they're going to have to compete against like the likes of Astralis or G2 around the contention of mid, they are going to uh, really, really struggle because I'm not a big believer of, of Shio and, and, and Nuke and also Labrov in history, I think he didn't do a good job of connecting with his mid laner because I remember, I believe he was a support of the roster with um, self-made and, and leader and crowny yep. and he yep. was always disconnected from that and we could actually leverage hilly's uh, priority into uh, providing ourselves a lot of relief around mid and i think this was also a big difference maker that made us go three and two against them okay by the way one i thought we could knock out pretty quickly because if i said that about bds i'll tell you a team that like they should just enjoy the winter split heretics is there's no way they're making groups and they're probably like the joke is fanatic should just be glad heretics exists because heretics look so bad dude like this is why last split i did hammer a lot that i actually thought yankos did very little wrong like even games where his score looked bad he did what you should do as a veteran jungler if your team's losing like you try and match the other jungler and get in a position do the counter count now you're gonna lose the game you're gonna look bad but that's actually a good sign by the way your jungler's willing to sacrifice but bro he is elo held so hard on this team now it's crazy like like, I, I, we had the discussion about All Pro earlier. This guy legitimately is one of the best junglers still, but he's on a team where not only are they bad, it's almost like the team was constructed to not work with Jankos. Like, he doesn't have any laners to work with. What's he supposed to do? Like, his solo lanes. Like, there's a reason. The joke is, again, if you want to add another one, the only reason Ruby doesn't get flamed by Dom every week is because he's too busy on his fucking heavy material, isn't he? Like, otherwise Ruby would <laughs> be straight in that crosshair as well, mate. Like, I don't know oh, if you're Jankos, what you're... So, like, coming from the jungle perspective what are you supposed to do if you're Yankos in this team I don't know how you could win these games I think this team is going to be last place oh no look to be honest it, I, I flame both of them a decent amount of my stream but it's just okay. there's something that triggers me about when they go to the cameras and right before the game you just see like Evie like he does this like thumb up thing and then everyone's like okay. oh he does and then he just sprints it down it just as as, as somebody oh, like that that existed as a player like I can't imagine just being a guy's teammate just see like a guy like playing up to the cameras like then like he posts like the like sad pi picture every single time but it's like the troll sad picture every single time they lose i can't imagine getting ran down by a guy and then just seeing him just to the camera every single time just the really dramatic one it's like hey bro like focus on your lane focus on your lane like shit we might end up losing i don't yeah. know man it, it triggers me so fucking hard but then also like what could have been the, the the upside of Evie? Like he didn't look good. Even he didn't even look good at Worlds. Like he didn't he didn't look good when he was playing against amateur teams or like not amateur teams, uh, wild card teams. So how is he going to look good versus some of the top players that you have in LEC? It doesn't make any sense. I don't see what the redeeming qualities are. And then the angle. Yeah, that, but Tom, yeah. what about those BO ones at MSI twenty twenty one? You know what I mean? Like, who gives a shit? Who gives? That's so long ago. It's so long ago now, guys. Like, no yeah. one get the joke is last time Ebby was popping off. Perks was on cloud nine for fuck's sake. Oh no! It's, <laughs> what more do you want? It's, you know, I'm not hating. That's just true. Yeah, I mean, it's also like the way he popped off was like he had like an Urgot counter pick that people weren't batting yeah. out, and then he just like played well on the Urgot, I guess. Where it's like, I mean, okay, nice. And then people yes. banned the Urgot, and then he was like not good anymore. I don't know, man. I'm I'm seeing this over and over again. He just it seems like he has zero macro. And worse than that, he has zero awareness. It's like he perma plays lock screen or something. I've never watched a stream, but I would actually wonder how much does he actually look at the map? Because it seems like he just doesn't have information that he should have. <laughs> like, like oh. it, was, it was inadvertent that I even mentioned Evie about that. Just as a side thing. And he's already gone again. It's like I pulled the string in his back, didn't I? He's yeah, on no, it already. No. I know. I just realized wait, this could go like 10 minutes more, man. Yeah, no, this is this is uh, this is crazy. He it's was completely good. unaware. And then there's multiple layers to this. All right, Thorne, you said you this said is a new Yoma for you, isn't it? You just hate this motherfucker. Just get him out the league, right? Just <laughs> no, get him out I, the league. I don't even like. It's not like a personal thing. No, no he seems cool, but you, just as a player, you despise him as a player. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I just, I really hate the way he plays. I really, really hate the way he plays because. It, also, here's one thing: if you're gonna fucking in, don't in somebody who I really like. Don't in Yankos. Out of anyone you okay. could fucking in, don't okay. it, my boy. Yeah, just, in somebody okay. else. In somebody else. If you int Adam, yes. like uh, let's say Evie was a jungler, he into Adam, yes. I'll be fine with it. I'll, I'll probably just be flaming Adam or something. I, I, would, I would force myself to, to, to just be delusional. But you're into Yankos every game. And then it's like, 
what, what the fuck happened? Like Adam just ran it down. He was actually trolling. Adam was playing to lose, right? He, he actually was griefing on stage intentionally. And somehow Evie is not able to like get an advantage that means anything and, and win the game. What the fuck did Adam do in that Heretics game? <laughs> How was that good at all? He literally just ran it down. And then he tried to like, he went on the stage afterwards. And he's like, yeah, you know, I was helping my bot lane here. How? You gave the Philios first blood and died under turret. You're lucky that Mercer can't use his flay and has no ability to press his summoners. You're lucky that that guy just cannot use his abilities. Or you just died for free, you gave a Philios uh, first blood, and your lane is fucked. He was level 2 to like level 7. The fuck was going on top lane? It's actually a 5 level lead top. And Adam's not smart enough to then go and suicide for the wave to crash it and like, you know, actually play Inting Scion from that point. So he just did the least possible. And then Evie just misses like his combo in every single team fight. Nice. Cool. That's the game. <laughs> this guy, like, the thing that's going to trigger me the most is when people try to make a narrative, and I, I know it's coming because these motherfuckers oh. love using stats. When people start making a narrative about his his stats, his laning stats, because he played like a 1v0 lane, and then he also played a lane where he started with first blood, so now his, his stats are inflated. It's like he's got nice. gold advantage on people. <laughs> Dude, he's not good in lane. He's not good in team fights. He is he, he has one game that he won off Cassante the entire time, and he will consistently make the worst decision macro wise in team fights now the problem is that ruby also makes the fucking worst decision possible so it's like how do you win games with this team man like you any type of lead you get with either of these guys it's like they have no idea where other people are on the map even which is crazy so you can't even say it's communication because i i would doubt that that either of these players like even even if there's no communication you would know what the fuck the the right decision is because you see the people that are coming towards you on the map they have perfect information a lot in a lot of these situations and they don't use it so you literally just have people that are bad at league of legends but they're occupying your veteran roles on rosters that's the part that's the worst right the new players yes. you're supposed to be bringing up is the bot lane right so you have this veteran top side but the veteran top side those players are worse at league and, and have worse macro sense and have worse team fighting sense and worse game sense than your young players so what are they helping them with just I just realized as well, I didn't even thought of that angle. That's even more egregious that you put Jankos, as far as I can tell, by the way, a guy who's, if you listen to it, if you ever listen to G2 comms, sound like an amazing comms, very good, like leader. You've given him a Japanese player and a Korean player. Like what? That's his solos. Like again, it's like you're trying to, is this a fucking escape room for Jankos? He has to find a way out. Like the fuck is this shit? <laughs> it's outrageous, no isn't it? I know. And yeah. also, by the way, I'll give you a very quick point I always make, but I'll make it here to be fair. This is also why Ruby will get to play in the LEC longer than Evie because Evie plays top lane. So when he hits, it's obvious, right? If you play mid lane and you just play a zero every game, you're, you just look half, you can be just as bad, but you look half as bad. You know what I mean? Like you can just like sort of, you can like slowly lose a game where you just do nothing. And at the end you go, well, my score line was like one, two, four, you know, it's all right. It's like, no, they're both bad. They both suck. They both suck. Yeah. I mean, they, they, I, I would be very surprised if they're both not gone. And also, I don't even think that Peter Dunn picked these guys. Like, when he came in yeah. in the offseason, when you look at, like, when he was signed and, like, the, everything that was happening with EG, and they're not Peter Dunn players. Like, if you think about every player that Peter Dunn has signed, he loves ERLs. Like, he loves amateur. Yes. Peter Dunn's the guy who's like, ooh, like, did you watch this amateur? He'll, like, randomly bring up an amateur match to me. He's like, did you see this? This player looked really impressive. The fuck? Uh, no, I'm not watching amateur, Peter. Like, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. He's the guy that loves I that know. shit. So why would you pick two players? These are the, literally the antithesis of what he would actually want on his team. So I'm I'm so done with this team. They both better be gone by summer because they have players that are competent, right? Ice Bisto is one of the best tops. Is he not one of the best tops in fucking LGP? Yeah. yeah. And he's been like years and years and years and years. Yeah. I mean, that, isn't that the player? Don't you want like a, a weak side top? And then Zyru is this guy who has really big fucking... So potential. isn't Ice Beast that she Polish? I'm pretty sure Yankos probably even knows him. I mean, am I wrong? Is, is he Polish, Yamato? I, I believe he's Polish. Yeah, I think yeah. he is, right? Yeah. yeah. It's better than I mean, having a Japanese player who, look, the joke is this, right? If ever, I love all those tweets that Jankos does about all the funny stories about Evie. Almost every single one involves him not being able to speak English. Like, has no one noticed that's the gag? <laughs> Bro, that's your top player there. I, I, also, I, think Evie just hates him. I think Evie just hates him as a person because you read the tweet and it says, okay. how do you feel now? And then Yanko says, worse than before. And then Evie says, nice. And then he runs it down in game. So it's go. like... <laughs> no, the joke is... Like, 
<laughs> Obviously, fucking Evie must have just I think been... he speaks perfect English. I think Evie, actually. here's what actually happened. Evie was just a massive simp for that, like, cosplayer that Jankos was messing around with last year. And this is his way of getting back at Jankos. Like, Jankos is, like, the cool kid with the Letterman jacket in high school. And then <laughs> Evie's, like, that nerd who's, like, going to get his own back and, like, ah, I'll get him. This, she doesn't deserve you, man. Like, you know, it's just like that shit. <laughs> exactly. He's going... He's I don't know, man. Fucking like, Jankos I, 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 I would say, TV ratings, I think last split... The, the one saving grace for them was their awareness of how bad they are. That's, that, that's, <laughs> on, because, that's a great opening line. Go on. Because, because they, like, basically, they, they were so limited in their macro, their mid to late game, that they could only do one thing. That is curl up into a five-man ball and just be on the mid wave. And they tried to pick Kesante, Azir, and just pick these front-to-back compositions. They had some they, good band-aids, for sure, yes. And and they took wins off of teams that uh, uh, that didn't manage to find that self-awareness. It's like they took a win off of Fnatic, and they tried to do this thing where they played the Gwen top, and they tried to win a game through side, and then turns out Fnatic didn't know how to do that appropriately, and they completely threw that game. And, and I think that... Um, you know, in the context of, 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 of that, you know, that is an upside. And now in this split, they're trying to do something different, right? It's like, Evie is playing Trintamir and Gwen. And it's like all of these issues are even more glaringly amplified and, and, and visible that hopefully this will give them some kind of opportunity to get better, right? Because I would, I would hate the fact if they like com- continue drafting in that manner where they just get away with you know, death balling on five on midwave and sneaking wins and then kind of somehow crawling their way into best of threes to just get stomped. Like that is like in my mind, if if I'm working with this, it's like we're gonna fucking throw everything on the line. We're going to try to fucking improve it. And if not, we don't qualify to the best of threes and that's what it is. Like what does it matter if we get to play another week of of, of games playing away that is not gonna lead to anything if we think about the context of the whole year because if they continue down that line they're not going to qualify to the worlds they're not going to have any fucking chance to qualify to worlds and i think the main issue in their gameplay is it's like lane wise they're not that strong they they find themselves at disadvantages often even if they manage to find leads because Yankos is smurfing out of his mind in terms of how they manage side waves and how they play on side and how they leverage advantages from their lane positions, they are very bad at it. When the mid game comes, they don't know how to contest the mid wave. All the time they're showing five people. They're not leveraging Fog of War at all. They are not leveraging uh, that advantage. So the, only, the main thing you can do against Team Heretics is just leave your AD on mid contest the wave and then just steal their sideways and they're going to completely lose their head because they don't know how to collapse on the sideways or play in river when it's necessary. And I think that Team Eretic's level of macro is just way too low. Their level of lane phase is also way too low and I don't see the redeeming factor. It's like this, there was this one game that was a, a very, very good game from Team Eretic and that was like the 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 Draven game that Jack Spectra played where Yankos dove bought and they managed to get an Oh, the advantage. one versus XL when XL was completely yeah. running it down. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So that's like, yeah, that's like the one little, wow, that was that was nice. But I think Team Eretic's biggest blessing is that Fnatic is doing so shit yep. and then it's like Team Eretic versus XL is going to be a contentious game. Wow, they're, yes. they're going to fight for eighth and then yes. they might, might just bleed in. But the, it, there's a very clear, like, bottom three that, um, you know, have nothing on the teams uh, above them in my mind. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. Absolutely. I, I just think it's, like, completely criminal when you see the the ERL mid laners and then you see the fact that Ice Beasto can't get a fucking job. He can't get a job in LEC. And then you have, like, a Skarinin coming in and, and he's also representing ERL talent. Like, there is ERL talent. Like, well, there is. Really is. Like, dude, yeah, if people I mean, don't know, I don't even know why the Ruby guy's in LEC. Like, look, I know a few years ago, he, this guy came in and had a little bit of a flub split. That sacking guy should have had a chance by now, mate. Come on. Like, he can't have a fucking spot on an LEC team. Like, there's, there's I don't a think bunch you of people. Bring back Jizuke, man. Bring back Jizuke, man. Jizuke is a good sure. shot. Jizuke is a fucking yeah? machine. Sure. That would actually be a fun team to watch. Jizuke yeah. mid, and then you put Ice Beast on top. You got the weak side top laner. Jizuke can just do whatever the fuck he wants in the game. You got, like, a promising AD carry and Jack Spectra. Maybe then they can do something. But By I the mean, way, these, these I'll tell you right so now as well, Yankos would be the fucking dream jungler for Jizuke. He'll just, he'll just automatically clean up his fucking mess and be in the right places. Like, if you do that, Jizuke, by the way, is going to carry a lot of these best of ones. You'll, you'll be in the groups at least. Yeah, I'm yeah. with you. That would be a slam dunk move. No, that, like, that's the hardest part to watch is like, you think about the, the positions they play play with. It's not even that 
Evie and Ruby suck. It's that they're, they suck with advantages. Like their jungler gets them ahead yes. and then they're so bad at the game, they can't even win from a winning position. So you start, look at, look at two of the games. One of the games, Evie is laning 1v0. He's not laning against anyone. It's like a roaming Janna, but the Janna is not roaming. It's just sitting in the fucking lane behind you and, and doing nothing on the map. The other game is a game where Evie is getting first blood. How many games did Yankos gank top and get Evie a kill or gank mid and get Ruby a kill and just see them fucking run it down? They don't win when they're put in winning positions. They're not good at playing from behind. What are their yes. redeeming qualities? Actually, why are these players in the league? Why would you ever want to import over using players that are in your own system? Because that's the thing about it. That's the reason why I really don't like like yeah, import yeah. It on, on bad teams. It's the same reason I always flame in LCS uh, when we had like Ika and Tommy and all that stuff. I don't think it helps the league because these players are going to come over. They're going to like play for a split. They're not going to elevate the rest of the league, which is what an import's supposed to do. They're supposed to be really good. They're supposed to be like Photon or Bow, where you come in and you're like, oh shit, like I can learn something from this guy. And then the players in your region get better as a result of having practice against this guy for a whole split. And they start learning stuff. Malrong is another example of a good import. He's somebody who helped like European junglers get better at certain yeah. aspects that they weren't that good at. Yes. I see these players coming in. They're going to be here for what? Half a year, one year. They're going to run it down. No one gets better as a result. And then other players in ERLs are missing the opportunity to be in LEC and be, and learn something and get better that are actually there for the long haul that are going to stick around and be like the future of the league. So that's the main reason why, why I'm always flaming like imports that underperform yes. is I just feel like it's so unnecessary and I don't really think that it helps anyone. By the way, to loop this back into the discussion we had about like Dardo and Fnatic's GM, this is why I think GM is the most underrated role in all of fucking League of Legends. Because it's he sets the table, he gives you the tools you're working with. And like I think Peter Dunn's a fabulous coach. What is he supposed to do with these pieces? Like, there's no combination that makes these pieces like a top relevant playoff team that can go to worlds or something. That's impossible. So I think if you look at their team, this is why I told everyone the last two years, you've got to stop being a mark and getting hyped about orgs selling their their LEC spot. Because remember what they all hear you about? They go, oh my God, Schalke. Well, we know they don't have much money. Oh my God, BDS is buying in. But imagine BDS, they'll probably buy like big name players. And spend and all they've had is like an average team or a below average team. Then Misfits, by the way, one of the most goated orgs in years for making fucking nothing budgets turn into playoff teams. Like they did a mega job. Misfits is replaced by Heretics, remember? You enjoying this? Misfits was way better than Heretics. Like <laughs> Misfits had a whole bunch of lineups that they got into playoff scenarios. Like this, this team, again, they've overpaid for bad players, as far as I can tell. And I'm with you, Yamato. If you look at the macro angles and the fact that they can get sometimes lane leads, Bro, there's uh, there's no way Peter Don is bad at teaching fucking beginning players macro. Like it's probably his specialty. If I think the the student just doesn't learn in this scenario, they can't. Oh, can't something's holding them back. If we pivot, by the way, because you guys already pointed it out, another reason why this team has any hope whatsoever is that we don't yet know if actually excels any good. So let's talk about about XL, shall we? So how about this? First of all, I will just do the obvious joke, Dom, which is after XL won that game against Fnatic, obviously there was that tweet from Oduam there, wasn't there? It said, it's been a while since I fisted a 19-year-old. I thought, how inappropriate. How dare you leak a journal entry from Nicole LaPointe Jameson? That's not your business to leak. Whatever, you see what Jesus, man. <laughs> what the fuck? See what I did there? Metaphorically, of course. <laughs> Metaphorically, of course, yeah. Wait, how did you set that up as like the obvious joke? That is like the least <laughs> obvious joke no, no. I'll ever pick out. It's all good. <laughs> like, that was the trick. The I, obvious I misled joke you. you flame the CEO yeah. of EG in a different exactly. league. Yes, that's exactly. the obvious joke. Perfect. Exactly. Okay, got it. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Obviously, to be fair, I mean, some random guy who was like an intern might come in and go, no, but that's actually systemic, all the fisting. Like, oh, my bad. Sorry. Oh, well, maybe, maybe it's a society we should stop fisting people. Eh? Anyone? Anyone? Any takers? Like, who knows? Who knows how that works, eh? Who the fuck knows, eh? I'd maybe just stick with me and Richard Lewis here, but that's, that's just me. Right. So anyway, if we talk about XL, that's the problem. Is there one win was against Fnatic who was fucking dreadful, even worse than the last split. And so when you look at XL, it's like, look, the good news is Herex and Fnatic are so bad, maybe you get groups anyway. But like, it definitely isn't fixed as a team. Come out where you at on this team? Like, like I'll, I, if you don't know, by the way, I'll just, again, you might not know this. I actually did think that before the last split, they were going to be number one. I'm a mark. I, I got, I got, I was the ultimate chill dude. I really believed it. I thought this is Young Buck's comeback. He's going to show them all wrong. I even thought all, some mega bad opinions now, dude, like Targamas actually was like the secret OP and he's going to be one of the greatest players of all time. Look, a lot of these opinions have aged badly. Much like Danny on EG, but enough about that. So what are your you don't have to listen, leave that. Just let it go. What are your thoughts on Excel is the question. 
No, in, in in my mind, I think that they they had um, they they recruit a lot of players that were good at being uh, passengers. I, I think they kind of uh, they 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 functioned in in rosters where the other players were the engines and 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 the givers and the opportunity creators. And I think in this roster, like especially last year, I think they couldn't figure out how to like there is this allegory of the wooden spoons. Have you heard of it? Basically, it's like, it's basically a group of people eating, uh, they have these long ass wooden spoons. Oh, I know this analogy, it's about heaven, right? Is that the analogy? Uh, pretty much, it's like basically with these wooden spoons, uh, they are that long and you can't really eat, feed yourself uh, like soup with it. So basically you end up burning your face. Right, I'll tell you what, I'll, t I'll tell you this because there's a famous analogy that's like this. I think it's the same point. I'll just make it quickly. It goes like this. There's a premise that goes, if you go to heaven, if you go to hell, right? When you arrive there, all they have to eat with is really long chopsticks. Right, and like you're saying, when you try to use the chopsticks, that the angles too, but you can't get it in your mouth. And mm -hmm. here's the, here's the analogy. But when you go to heaven, it's the same scenario. But they know to feed the other person. You put exactly. the food into there. Is that the analogy you were talking about? It's a great Pretty analogy, much. by the way. Pretty like much that. your mentality and stuff, right? And I think I feel like in EXO, I think that, that they didn't have players that were like the connecting catalysts in their previous teams. Because contextually, I think there was always other driving factors behind the success that they found. I think of um, like Vettel, he always had Mersa and he had Zanzara and they were always giving up the resources to make sure that Vettel was set up for success. I think of Patrick, he was laning with Mickey last year and that's a very, very, you know, great support that will, uh, uh, of course, uh, elevate your ability to play and a lot of their uh, identity was that everything was leading into bot like they had the cled level six roam into bottom side they're always diving around bot and this is something that functioned Xerxes when he was successful in Astralis when we, when he had the space to farm and he played as Wukong and was allowed to reach that point where he has the divine Sunderer and then he was capable of carrying games and I think at that context in terms of how players are supposed to you know give themselves in order to make others succeed i think they couldn't really define what their identity should be i think at least now with with a player like limit maybe they can explore something like that but i think that the issue is now that they are lagging so far behind that i don't believe in a plausible scenario where they're going to be able to elevate themselves that much at least i think in terms of you know, some of their priority on Gragas. They've had some like decent meta reads that looks fine. I just don't see a world where they do damage to uh, the teams above them because right now, all of the things that maybe you would praise about each individual player in the in the previous year, that seems to also not be there. I think Udam is playing good. He he smashed uh, Oscar in, you know, that looks fine. But beyond yeah, that- Until you like, watched Oscar just completely get fisted in the other yes. two games and you're like everyone's yes, yes. fisting 19 year olds out here yeah, yeah. so it's like it's not that's not something to to celebrate right so i just think oh, it's systemic X was too far behind yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he was right Arsh Goyal was right that's okay perfect exactly he wasn't talking about his arsh on that one keep going <laughs> i can't believe no one ever made that joke by the way it was just right there the whole time <laughs> you got them excel baby no, I don't have to say anything. There's bro. no way I, you believe in this team, dude. That you still think oh, they suck, no. surely, because they do. Hell no. I think they can be better than uh, than Heretics and and Fnatic, though potentially. Yeah. I, I think that they have good enough players that they should just be able to just you know out muscle them in 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 the lanes and stuff. Because you know the the the, the problem that the that the uh, they are gonna have versus better teams is that they don't coordinate well, right? So other teams are going to be able to make plays, and it feels like they're just gonna be the victim of all the plays that are made against them. Think about the last time they played Heretics, where they got like Dove bot level three, where there should be some counterplay there. They just misplay it and they die. I feel like this this split, they'll be in a different, like now hopefully they're in a different mindset. They actually have a win under their belts early. People aren't expecting a lot from them compared to like last year where or last split where people were expecting a lot. So I think that maybe it'll be easier for them to actually show how good they are. Um, but I just don't think that they get they get past like maybe seventh eighth. I think they're just a team that goes into best of threes. They have the same issues. They're relatively slow. They're a boring team. They don't get much done in the map, but they can win games if you have a bad game or if you do nothing against them. I would say there's the key thing for me with XL. I've totally tempered my expectations. Like, as I said, I think they're still not that good now, quite frankly. And the fact that Fnatic looks so bad means I can't even really get that hyped about the win over them. But I also think if you look at the team, here's my expectations for this split. I don't think they can do anything. I don't think they can go to... They can't be the team that goes to playoffs, probably. There's better teams that are going to take those spots. So what I want is this. This is all I want. 
one of the players, it's either going to be Vethio or Patrick, at least give me like an individual split of performance. You know what I mean? Like if you're Vethio, yeah, maybe it doesn't work with your jungler. Maybe the team setup's not right. Maybe the comms, but at least give me some pop-offs, you know, get me your champions, lock them in and just show me something. Because the thing I'm worried about with this team is when it was built in the off season, look, it stretches like super team a little bit, but it was certainly a team of very good players and names. The stock of nearly all these names has dropped off a fucking cliff. Like, it's really, really bad. And so I'm really concerned about what the career future of these players are because if you're some like Vethio, you're supposed to just be like, look, it was one bad split. I was fucking dynamite those other splits. Put me in another team. Like the humanoid thing we're talking about. Like, you can reclaim these players. They could be really good with a different team. So, uh, like, if you're Patrick and Vethio especially, just show me something. You don't have to win games. Just show me something individually. Because I want to believe you're still really good individual players, you know. That's my take. Right, yeah. what about this then? Yeah, do you have anything else? No, I, I just wanted to add, I, I think with, with Humanoid, uh, sorry, with, with Theo and uh, of course, uh, Patrick specifically, I, I remember many regular season games that they always, always performed super, super good. But when I always try to remember these guys in the context of more high pressure situations when it came to the playoffs, yeah, true. I, I, I think Vithio has never won a single best of five in his career. Yeah, sure, you could you could talk about misfits and their limitations. That's a fair point, right? But I also remember it's like when we played against misfits and we played the best of five against them. I remember Meniski solo killing Vithio on Leblanc with Twisted Fate. And I remember the same thing with Patrick. We played against XL and then he gets, uh, you know, they had a game winning situations. We were about to get 3 0 and our story just finished there and he gets barreled in the forehead. You know, I think I think in terms of uh, that they have performed super, super good uh, under very specific circumstances. And that was like the main thing that uh, made me uh, concerned about them. They hadn't proven to me that they could perform super good in in any circumstance. And I think that separates a great player from a okayish player. So I'm with you. I'm hoping that these guys step up to the plate because they've shown good performances in specific contexts. I also think yes. meta might be better for them. The fact that Rakan is coming back for Limit, it's another guy who wants to be playing oh, engaged. Play so if Annie and Rakan sure, yeah. are, are yes. in, in the game, at least they'll have some element of aggression that they were missing last split, I hope. Krogus being back in the jungle is fucking huge for them. That's probably Xerxes' best champ that I remember him on it's outside of like Rumble too, yeah. Jungle. Yeah, it's like one of his best champs. I remember Pre Predator Krogus for like Origin in Season 10. He was one of the, the best. It was like him and Selfmade that were beyond everyone else when it comes to this champion. So maybe they can get some favor there. They're just not going to... They're never going to be a top team. They'll never be a top team. No, no. I mean, the best case scenario at the moment is they just have to compete with the BDSs and the Astralises of the world and do what they can and see if they can get above them and be like sixth or something. That's kind of like the best for me. Right, I left G2 till the end, mainly because they kept the same lineup. Like, I don't care that they lost the 1v1 to Astralis, guys. They are on paper the best team still. Like, Vitality has to show us more, you know. So I thought I'd leave them to the end because I just don't think we've got like an enormous segment. So what are your thoughts just Currently on on the G two squad, Yamato. What do you, where do you think of this? Are they still number one for you? Uh, yeah, I think we've seen too little for me to 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 make the, anything change. I, I think what's so good about G two is that um, I think uh, they uh, have a lot of depth in terms of how they draft. But I think the more important thing is that they don't seem to. Uh, like they seem very fluid and adaptable depending on what the game state is, and I think that is tied into what they play. I think they're very good at recognizing what needs to be done in order for them to be put in winning positions. I think they convert leads better than anyone. I think when they have Nasher, the game just closes and it's done. And I think this is a massive strength. I think that um, at G2, there is an inherent trust in each other they seem to have. Like whenever someone makes a decision, you know that everyone is committing to that decision, even in a circumstance where it's not the most precise. And that is something that is so, so important. Like I was talking to Hilly after they uh, they lost to, to G2, just to check how he's feeling. I don't know if I can share this, but he told me, he's like, G2, it's like I was saying, uh, you know, G2, I was just like cons cons consoling him. I was like, yo, yeah. how are you feeling? It's like G2 was a tough team to beat. You know, they're very different from everybody else. It's like, I was like, yeah, it's like fighting a Southpaw. They're very unique in, in the league and the context. He's like, yeah, they are fighting with their left hand, but also the right hand and their leg and their and their left leg and also their dick. Like they're fighting with, with, the, <laughs> with the whole body when they're committing to decisions. And that, I think that's really, really key. It's like, Who's the even... Dick? 
Mickey acts obviously. <laughs> when he's hard, he's hard. When he's flaccid, there's nothing going on there. And when he starts fucking you, Dom, he doesn't stop till he's fucked you till you're dead. Jesus. Metaphorically in a video game, of course. Yeah. Yes, of course. On I'm just going to continue, man. <laughs> Keep going, come on. And I think this G2, you know, um, the, the fact that they are committing behind every decision, and I think that's so important that they can, like, mechanically trust each other. It's like, if I can make a decision knowing, based on the context of my teammates champions and i make decisions based off of that that feels so much better to play that i know that my team is going to deliver and i think that's really really evident in what g2 is doing i think they convert leads they transfer pressure super super well but i think in a lot of games they've gotten away with a lot when their drafts are on paper a lot worse like for example that game against uh, mad lions when they had uh, uh, samira jarvan so it's like braun varos flashes on them level one they fuck up they i think they could have pressed press for a kill if kazi plays good then they base after wave two varos has no items at all he just bases for potions i don't know what the fuck he based for samira jarvan is stacking a wave into you and your sejuani pattern to top because in his mind the communication was clear they can't fucking dive us we have control over the wave and all of a sudden didn't happen samira jarvan dives the varos and the brom because they have no flash for some fucking reason and then all of a sudden jarvan fixes your top lane wave state it's like broken blade was getting completely fucked by the fiora he was in a, such a losing situation jarvan went top because he has such a big tempo swing and then he goes into mid this fucking Cassio into into Kled lane. Cassio can't fucking posture at all because Jax flashes on his head and then Javan has prior. It's like they're very good at transferring winning positions, but the fact that that happened in the first place is crazy. And that's why I think that the Stralis game is so important because that highlighted something, you know? If you cut through the crap and you actually play good fundamentally, G2 can potentially give you opportunities when they get um, lost in their own source but if you give them an advantage you're not gonna fucking get that back <laughs> the worst thing is you're making really good points say like, you're all you're all you said was fighting him out but dom's can't handle it right now it's okay so i got him good with that one, that Mickey X one got him. He, he won't stop fucking you until you're dead you know why he's for that fight that, <laughs> that, that part is i, I can't, I I can't have no that, that might, all right you know what tom just get maybe, us out of here maybe that was slightly <laughs> too much. far i know exactly <laughs> oh i will say as well <laughs> To be fair as well, on a more serious point, there's also why if you if you watch G2 yeah. last split, you should be terrified. Because if anything, we're now entering, it's now that we're entering Mickey X's meta. Dude, he was probably the MVP of last split. It wasn't even his meta. Like, bro, if it's really going to be Leona all day long, he's going to fucking smurf this split, boys. He's going to smurf. 